Alaikum Shalom, hey. Welcome everybody. So the crowd is coming in. How are you, Reb Chase? How was the oh, sheer on the Rambam? <laughs> you know, the greatest feeling in the world. Go ahead. To be finished giving a share. <laughs> right. How was it? It's over. <laughs> Baruch Hashem. <laughs> right. Okay, but you don't even go to get out to celebrate as you come to another shear. Yeah, exactly. I don't have time to agonize over it. Yeah. Okay, hold on. I got to mess with this. You know the sicha any day a bais a derech melichkin. I said if you actually been zaka, he didn't have time. Think about where he is spiritually. Yeah, that's right. Just kind of back to back zooms, and then you never have time to worry about that stuff. Yeah. Is this this mic working? Yeah, we hear you nicely. We hear you nicely. Hey, welcome, everybody. We're going to begin momentarily. Thank you, Rabbi Shays, for joining us. And thank you, everybody, who's gracing us here with your wonderful presence on this special evening. Chavdala Tevis, Tovshin Pei Beis. I think we could begin, right? Do you want to wait another few moments? Maybe wait, wait till 10.03. It's a Jewish crowd, you know. Okay. I like the soul words. Black fire and white fire. Mimino Eish Das Lomai. It's all part of the, the design over here. Okay, I updated the document, by the way. I don't know if you have it open, but. Uh... Uh, no, but that's a good idea. Okay, I have it. It's 10 or 4, so I think. So we think Lekula, we're safe? Lakula Alma, we could begin. Yeah. Okay. All right. Say that? Yeah. Okay. The video you have, right? I'm just going to give oh, an introduction. I have the video. That is correct. So give me one more second. To... It's fine. I'll give, I'll give an introduction. Okay. Okay. Welcome, everybody. And thank you so much for gracing us with your presence on this special evening, the yard site of the Alter Rebbe. Of course, Chavdala Tevis, the 24th night of the month of Tevis. This evening is our second tribute to the Rebbe's Chayzer, Rabbi Yoel Khan, Zechrenel of Rach, who passed away, Vav of last summer, 5781, and whose contribution to the world of Chassidus Chabad, 
to the teachings of Chassidus, the elucidation of Chassidus, of Tanya, and of all of Chassidus, was extraordinary, as we discussed at length in our first Zoom that we did shortly after the passing of Rabbi Yael. Tonight's program, as Rabbi Shais will soon introduce it, is dedicated to the Tanya, especially on the yard set of the author of the Tanya. But I do, as an opening, want to share something I heard from Rabbi Yael Khan, myself, and it was extremely moving. And he told us once, it was Chavdal Tevis, and he was fabrenging, and he said that in the year Tov Shin Chav Gimel, 1963, was the 150th anniversary of the Alter Rebbe's passing, and it was Metzai Shabbos, which is exactly the same night when the Alter Rebbe passed away. So Machzedek writes that the Petira was around 10.30, Kachatzai Shah Yer Aleph, Metzai Shabbos, Parashat Shmois, Metzai Chav Gimel Tevis, the night of Chavdal Tevis. And the Rebbe came down to a Fabrengen, literally at the moment that the Alter Rebbe returned his soul to its maker. And he told us that the Rebbe's face was so serious. And it simply, he said, he, you never saw him that way. It was like he was in a different world. And the whole Fabrengen was so intense. It literally felt like there was like a higher reality, a transcendent reality that was manifested in 770 at the time. And then he told us something very special. He said that the Rebbe's voice was not his regular voice, his demeanor, his face, his tone. And after the Fabrengen, Bero Rifkin, Reb Moshe Doiv Be Rifkin, who was Rosh Hashiva of Tera Vadas, and who was present at the Histalkas of the Rebbe Rashab and wrote a sefer called Ashkaf to the Rebbe, was very close to the base Harav of the Rebbe Rashab, extremely close. Reb Moshe Doiv Be Rifkin came over to the Biel after the Fabrengen. And he told him, Du was gezen, was gehert. Did you see? Did you hear? So the Biel told us, he said, I played dumb because I wanted to know what he saw and he heard. So I said, Vos, what was I supposed to see and hear? And Rev. Bero Rifkin said, So given the coil from the Alter Rebbe, it was the voice of the Alter Rebbe. The Biel finished the Fabreng in the middle of the night, probably two, three in the morning. I went home <laughs> and I put on, those days there was a tape. I put on the tape of Chavdal Tevis, Tav Shil Chav Gimel. There was no video yet, but there was a tape. And it's incredible. I don't know if you ever heard it, Reb Sheis, to hear that Fabrengen, the night, the time when the Alter Rebbe passed away. You can hear that the Rebbe's voice is different, and you could sense, you can almost sense in your bones the extraordinary divine energy in the room. The Rebbe says a mimer there, a short mimer from the Alter Rebbe, and I don't know how to describe it. It's almost like Rabbi Yael said. It's like you feel the Alter Rebbe saying the Maimer. It, it, it was, it's like divinity itself without levushim, without any garments. The Rebbe's suchis and was structured, but this was like completely pure, undiluted in the slightest, without any tzimtzum for the audience. The next night, there was another Fabre, and he said the Rebbe was completely different. It was much more uh, in a much different state of mind, so to speak. So now it's actually a few minutes before the time of the Histalkas of the Alter Rebbe. So it's a very special time to gather and to focus on the Alter Rebbe's magnum opus, which is the Sefer Atanya. Tonight's evening is dedicated in the memory of a very, very special chassid who was the Mashpi of Montreal for 60 years, a Mekubal, a great human being, a Gon, a chassid, a serious, earnest, Ovid Hashem. And one of those legends in the world of Chabad, Reb Volv Gringlas, whose 11th yard site was commemorated on the 22nd day of Tevis. So today's evening is dedicated in memory of Rabbi Gringlas and his wife, Harav HaChassid, Reb Menachem Ze'ev, Ben Avram Yechiel Halevi, and his Rebetzin Esther, Bas Reb Moshe, Tehene Shmosam Tzler, Reb Tzler HaChayim, Dedicated by his beloved grandson, who's a close friend of mine, Zalmi and Sarala Cohen. So thank you very much for your friendship and your love, Zalmi and Sarala. And I want to wish Zalmi also a very happy birthday. This is not part of the program, but I happen to know that today was his birthday, the 23rd day of Tevis. You should have an amazing year and an amazing life and a big mazel tov for the birth of your daughter. They had a daughter yesterday whose name is Henya, and uh, 
We all wish you a heartfelt mazel tov and only nachas and simchas with tremendous joy, happiness, prosperity, with her chava. And thank you so, so much, Zalmi and Sarah LeCohen for this special dedication and tribute to your unforgettable grandfather, Reb Wolf Gringlas and grandmother. I'm going to begin with a vart of Reb Wolf Gringlas that he used to say, he heard this from his mashpia, Reb Zalman Schneerson of uh, Poland, who, uh, who, in the name of the Magid of Mizrich, the Magid of Mizrich said this vart. And of course, the Magid is the one who, who was the Rebbe of the Alter Rebbe. And the Magid said as follows, it says in Tehillim, chapter Ayin Dalad, Literally, it means day belongs to you. Night also belongs to you. You created the luminary and the sun. Said the Magad of Mizrich, there are two philosophies in life. Listen to this. One philosophy in life is Lecha. You're at the core and the center of my life. Everything is ultimately about lecha, about you, about my relationship with you. It's a dimension of life where at the center of the universe and at the center of reality is the infinite love and the presence of the creator. There's another philosophy in life. It's called aflecha, also you. (laughs) In other words, I'll carve out a little place for you. But God ultimately is secondary to life. You know, we, we find a little place it's called Tafel. Aflecha. Also you. Says the Magid, Lecha. When your life is completely focused on Hashem, it's God-centered. Yoim. It's a life, it's a life filled with day, with light, with brightness, with clarity. Aflecha. When God becomes a secondary accessory to life, Laila. Then life is very dark. Life is difficult. That's the teaching of the Magid. And here you have it in the words of Reb Wolf himself in Yiddish. And then I introduce to you Rabbi Shays Taub to begin the actual program. You have to enable screen sharing. Me? And then I'll, yeah. Or whoever the host is. I'm not the host. Whoever the host is should enable screen sharing. You could share your screen now. Yeah, I can share my screen. Okay, excellent. And we're going to share this video. And volume. Ready? You see it? Yeah, volume. Here we go. We're not getting volume. One second. Okay. All yours, Rip Chase. Okay, excellent. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for setting uh, the stage, setting the tone. And uh, as, as you mentioned, this is a part two. Part one was uh, some months ago. So uh, after uh, a few months intermission, we're, we're back. And the specific focus is, is on Tanya. Um, 
Rabbi Yoel was many, many, many things, and we mentioned that in part one back in uh, Menachemov. But one of the things Rabbi Yoel was, was uh, a Tanya teacher par excellence, perhaps the quintessential Tanya teacher, which is a serious a serious concept because in the Hagdama to Tanya, the Alt Rebbe embeds within the system of Tanya the necessity for local teachers. In the Hagdama of Tanya, the Alt Rebbe himself in the Hagdama Samalak, it says that this book doesn't work on its own. You need to have local teachers. And Rabbi Yoel, in the tradition of seven generations of local teachers, was a local teacher, but I would argue that because of the advent of technology, albeit primitive technology, mostly cassette tapes, he was the first local global Tanya teacher. And uh, so I'm going to turn it back to you, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchok, to speak a little bit about Rabbi Yoel specifically as a Tanya teacher, both locally and the local global through, uh, through the technology that was at his disposal. Yeah. Okay, That's, uh, that brings back a lot, a lot of memories and very, for me personally, very moving memories and very stimulating memories. Because growing up in the Chabad school system, we started to learn Tanya at a very young age. But if I could be a little blunt, I didn't understand a word. My friends, I don't think understood anything. It was more, you know, you read it, um, many of the teachers, although with good intentions, didn't have the ability to bring it to life. And uh, we didn't understand the structure of it, the depth of it, the intricacies of it, and certainly not the relevance of it. Obviously, certain words and concepts stick and they have an impact, but unfortunately, unfortunately uh, it was, you know, many of us saw it, I, I, I'm, 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 it's, it's sad for me to say, but we saw it as very boring and, and monotonous. It was at the end of a long day, you know, we just waited for the class to end so we can get home. In, in the early 80s, when I was a child, the Yoel began teaching Tanya every week on the telephone system that they started to call Shuri Chesidus Idea Telephone. And he would give a half an hour weekly class in Tanya, of course, in Yiddish, and he really opened up the Sefer for many of us because of two things. Rabbi Yoel was a brilliant, brilliant teacher in terms of structure. He showed you how to categorize, how to organize ideas, how to structure ideas. He showed you how a chapter was built. He was an architect, and he showed you the architecture of the Alter Rebbe in Tanya. There's a foundation. There's the first floor, there's the second floor, until you reach the roof. That's how he would teach himself, but he showed it to you in the text. So you saw how themes developed. He also showed you why this choice of word was, why this choice of, why this, why the Alter Rebbe chose these words, this phraseology. And he gave you really an appreciation of the mosaic, of the tapestry, of the overall structure, but also of the details. The Yoel had, uh, what I once told somebody, he had like the Brisker methodology in Chsidis. The methodology of Reb Chaim of Brisker was extremely analytical and he knew how to dissect and take apart pieces and then put the puzzle back together and show you how not to get confused and how to see the structure. And Reb Yoel did that to the Tanya. The Tanya is the Tanya, but Reb Yoel, with his capacity, he opened up the Sefer to so many of us who learned Tanya with him. I heard from him those classes and then later I heard Tanya live from him. Rabbi Yoel himself probably taught Tanya, I don't know how many times, but he would teach Tanya sometimes the same year, many, many, many times. He probably gave hundreds and hundreds of classes, cycles on Tanya to different audiences. When I was a Bachi, he would teach Tanya every Mitzvah Shabbos in Borough Park live. A large crowd would come, and then I heard Tanya from him. Again, either I was there or I heard the tapes afterwards. I went on Shlichus as a Bachi to Boston. We learned on, in the Yeshiva G'dayla of Boston, 9 Prescott Street in Brookline. So at night... In the nice weather, I would take, uh, then it was whatever they had, a Walkman, I don't remember. And I went through the whole Tanya with Rabbi Yoel from his classes on the telephone. I walked around the Charles River <laughs> almost every night. And I learned through the whole 53 chapters of the first section, 12 chapters of the third, second section, 
and then the other whatever he had on the other sections of Tanya. I took notes for myself as well. But those were, for me, that was extremely, extremely memorable because Rabbi Yoyal, uh, gave me, and I think he gave so many people, really an understanding of how to appreciate a chapter and ideas. Besides that, Rabbi Yoyal also, it was contextual. In other words, it wasn't just he showed you the structure of the Tanya, but he would really explain the ideas in a very, very beautiful, beautiful and very clear and lucid fashion. And he did this for, for so many people for which we are, we are grateful. And today, many of the lessons and teachings of Tanya are in one way or another based on that. I have to say also, you know, I started to teach Tanya when I was a bacher. I wasn't expecting it, but Heichel Menachem in Borough Park, its uh, leader at the time was Rabbi Aaron Ginsburg. He comes over to me and says, I want you to start teaching Tanya. Rabbi El was giving classes then. I'm like, Rabbi El teaches Tanya. I'm not teaching Tanya. I don't do this for a living. And he nudged me, you need an English class in Tanya, an English class in Tanya. And we started, and it took me six, <laughs> took me six years in Borough Park every Sunday. I went through the 53 chapters of Tanya, which later became a tape series called A Tale of Two, <laughs> a Tale of Two Souls. And Rabbi Yael's, Rabbi Yael's classes was literally the foundation of how I can teach Tanya. I'm also very grateful to Rabbi Adin Steinzel, Rabbi Adin Evan Yisrael, who did an amazing series on Tanya called Beer Tanya with a Yellow Jacket. Because he really showed me how to apply a lot of these ideas in a very uh, psychological and emotional way. Rabiel wouldn't focus so much on that. Rabiel focused more on the pristine ideas. But Rabbi, Shte, Rabbi Adin Evan Yisrael really, you know, he, in so many ways, even though he doesn't, uh, doesn't have uh, the same style or methodology of Rabiel at all, but a lot of the themes of Tanya, he really brings down in a very emotionally relevant way to to real life. And then Rabbi Label all time, he should be well, started Chesidus Mavoeris, creating like the, the Tanya with beautiful, beautiful explanations and many others who did Svarim on time, but Chesidus Mavoeris was another classic. And uh, all of these uh, great contributions really, I think opened up the world of Tanya to many of us. I'm unmuted now, okay. Sorry, I thought I, yeah, okay. You mentioned the, the structure, Rabbi Yoel, and, and structure. Um, so when I, when I made the Tanya map for uh, Kohos many years ago, um, I'm thinking now I'm married over 20 years. So this was not Shona Roshayna, but maybe the second year I was married. So like 20 years ago. So we showed it to him and one of the, he, he only re, he really made one change, and it was a structural change. The whole Tanya map, the whole idea of the Tanya map was structure. So uh, I, I think I mentioned this last time um, in the last yeah, episode. Yeah, but it was just so remarkable the way he explained it. And like you said, you know, an architect, the way he explained it is like he saw you're, you have to build a building that's going to stand. It was yeah, very... Yeah. It was it was like an engineer building a bridge or an architect building building a building. What, what I had originally is that um, the simcha prokim. So I had that as chovav through uh, lamid. I had it through lamid aleph, and then lamid base comes. It's one perik, and then after lamid base starts a new topic of dira b'tachtenim and lamid gimel. Lamed Gimel, Dira B'tachtenim, Yismach Yisrael Be'ezov. It's all about uh, Lamed Gimel, Lamed Dalet, Dira B'tachtenim. So Rabbi El said, no, Lamed Gimel and Lamed Dalet belong to the Hemshech of Chavav through Lamed Aleph, which was Simcha. So my retort was, but Lamed Beis came and stopped it. He said, Lamed Beis is a Maimir Muska. <laughs> it pauses it. And afterwards you see, and in the, the Madura Kama, you see this much. No Lamed Beis. Yeah, how and, and how Lamed Al flows right into uh, Lamed Gimel. So um, I, I, I said, so so what? Basically, you have Simcha, and then you stop, and you go back to Simcha. It's like, yeah. <laughs> so I said, well, hold on a second. Lamed Gimel, Lamed Al is about Dira B'tachtenim. He says, no. Lamed Lamed Hey, Lamed Vav, Lamed Zayin is Dira B'tachtenim. I said, well, hold on. What are you What are you happy about in Lamed Gimel, Lamed Al? He says, ah, but it's what you're happy about. <laughs> 
<laughs> so it's the simcha about dirab tachtayim, and therefore it belongs to the prokem about simcha. And right. then lamed hey is when dirab tachtayim becomes a subject unto itself, not the simcha of it, but the mechanics of it. And therefore, that's those. Th- those are two different, two different series. Chof vav through lamed dalid with a little interruption in the middle for lamed base, and then lamed hey we start the real dirab tachtayim. So anyways, I have to mention something. It's just very special. In one of the last years, probably 1991, I have to look up when, the Rebbe de Fabrengen asked, why is it if Perik Lamed Beis is the heart of Tanya, it's where the Alter Rebbe articulates the shit of Chesidus and Aves Yisrael, how it's the essence of the whole Torah. How is it that in the first version of Tanya, the Alter Rebbe didn't put it in? And you know what the Rebbe answered? He said something, wow, he said as follows. The Mishnah says in Maseches Adius, Lama Nishnu Divre Hayachid. Why is it once there's a halacha established like the majority, why are we quoting the individual opinion that was rejected? And the answer is, because if one day a chacham is going to come and he's going to say the majority got it wrong, I have a great svara to reject their view and choose a different view. So we're going to tell them, there was a great sage who held this way and it was discussed. You didn't invent, you didn't invent this Swari, you didn't invent America, and they rejected it. So it's fine, don't worry. So the Rebbe said, So the Alter Rebbe in the first Madura didn't put in Pedic Lamed Beis. Why? He said, There may be somebody who will come and say that Avis Israel is not the essence of Tanya. Avis Yisrael is not the heart of Tanya. It's not the core of Tanya. It's not. So we said there was already a Madura Kama. It was entertained. And then the Alter Rebbe said, no. <laughs> the halach is that Perik Lamed Beis is the heart of Tanya. <laughs> and I think that has a lot, a lot of, I think there's many layers of significance to the statement. What is the Hava Amina? Because sometimes whenever you lose focus of that Nekuda of love of Avas Yisrael, you know, you could lose focus. You could get carried away in, in, in good, holy stuff. And Alter Rebbe is saying, remember what the heart, the heartbeat of Tanya is. If it's not turning you into a real ambassador of love, then you, you lost the heart. I think it should also be noted that the fact that Pedaglavid base, Pedaglav, is not just because it's a cute mnemonic, because, oh, Lave, it's the heart of Tanya. But we're talking about structure. Pedagogy base is hinged upon structure. It tells you from the first line that there's a context. And I think the biggest mistake, we're getting ahead of ourselves, but I think one of the biggest mistakes we make is trying to do 32 without doing 31. When 30 tell, 32 tells me from the first line that it's an outgrowth of the proper application of 31. If I haven't yet undergone this mental shift about myself being a soul, how am I supposed to do it for you? I think sometimes in Lubavitch, we skip to the Mivtsoyim Avos Yisrael, we forget about the man in the mirror Avos Yisrael. But anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself because what I wanted to do, because structure... I think it's was- also important, you mentioned Rabbi Yael's classes on Tanya. Yeah. Rabbi Yossel Weinberg, Zechrein Elavrach, who had the schuss of starting the classes of Tanya on the radio in 1960, and he would give in his classes on Tanya to the Rebbe, and the Rebbe edited it, and that became Shiurim B'Sefer Tanya in, he- in Yiddish and Hebrew and English lessons in Tanya. But the Rebbe wrote an enormous quantity of comments and explanations on Tanya on those classes in the radio, but some of them are not easy to understand because the Rebbe's writing was so brief and concise, and Abiel in his classes was also a tremendous contribution that he elucidated and, and brought out the, the depth of so many of the Rebbe's insights and explanations in Tanya, which focus a lot on the flow, on the sequence, on the structure, and on the precision of the words that the Alter Rebbe uses, the phrases. So that was, I think, also a very special gift, just parenthetically. I'm sorry, so, continue. <laughs> speaking of structure, what I wanted to do is um, use the structure of Tanya itself to organize the agenda for tonight. Um, so, I, but I wanna have a, this is not a, uh, in a, an, an extemporaneous Tanya Shir on Gan Prokin. I wanna have a specific focus. And the specific focus is 
you know, your, your brother, Rab Simon, has, has a great story about he, he was, I think he was teaching in Beis Rivka, and he had an opportunity, because he was working with the Sichas, to give to, notes for his shir to the Rebbe for, call it Hago, uh, for notes for, for a shir. So uh, he, he, he mentions that when he was teaching Tanya to the girls, he wanted to know when he teaches the Sharblat, Kikarev Elecha, Dovim Ha'od, can he translate Kikarev, what does it mean, close? Could he translate Kikarev as relevant? And the Rebbe agreed to that, to that translation. So what, what I want to focus on tonight is Tanya being relevant. And I want to speak about some of the trouble areas that cause today's students of Tanya to struggle with this question and to wonder, to be left wondering, just how relevant is Tanya to me? Okay, so if we could make that our, our goal, to, to go through Tanya and just to speak about some of the common areas where people are left wondering, is this relevant? Or how is this relevant? Yeah? If I may add, if I may add, I would find this meaningful because I have, I receive many emails and questions both in person, live, and also through, through email, et cetera, of people, including people who grew up within the Chabad school system, yeshivas, girls' schools, and they went through and they learned through Tanya. And, and I'm now literally quoting what people have shared with me, that I, I'm, I'm, it's painful for me to say, they're, they feel that they're allergic they're allergic to the book. I said, why? They said, I feel so judged. I feel it's so harsh. Somebody said, it's so harsh. It's so negative. It's like, you can't get away with, with anything. I'm scrutinized on every thought and, and word and action. And the standards are so not real. They're, they're so not practical. I have anxiety on a good day. I can't, I can't increase the anxiety. I can't increase my anxiety, and this increases my anxiety. For me, these words are very painful to hear. And I'll tell you why they're painful to hear. They're painful to hear for, for obvious reasons, but one of the reasons uh, for me personally is because in the introduction of Tanya, I heard this from Reb Chaim Shalom Daich in Hadich a few years ago in Chavdal Tevis. He said, look at the introduction of Tanya. The Rebbe says, I didn't want to write a Sefer. I wanted to speak to people, com communicate verbally. But now I realize they have to put down the questions in a Sefer. But what are his words? He says, Right, I'm writing the Sefer for people who know me. And he says, All of my Talmudim, all of the Hasidim. And his words are, There was a conversation of love that transpired between us. And they revealed to me all of their secrets in their mind and in their heart, in terms of their life and their service of Hashem. So the Alter Rebbe says these conversations, which he describes in the introduction as a dibur shel chiba, as a conversation that was based on affection and love. He says, this is what I'm transcribing in the Tanya. So to quote Reb Chaim Shalom Daich, Harav Reb Chaim Shalom Daich, he says, if you learn a Pedic in Tanya and you do not feel and you do not experience in your bones and in your gut and in your mind <laughs> the flow of love. Start over. <laughs> You're reading the wrong book. You're reading the wrong book. Why does Al put in an introduction? Why is it relevant? He could say we had conversations, loving conversations, serious conversations, serious. Dibur Shal Chiba, every parak, every word is a manifestation of profound, ecstatic, divine love. And if I'm not feeling it, I'm not judging anybody. We, we have to help each other. That's what he says in the introduction. We have to help each other. But, but this is, I think this is not just important, but I think it's critical and vital. And for those who ask these questions, I thank you for asking these questions. You can even ask them tonight if you want here on the chat, or if you want to unmute yourself, maybe we could do that also later. But... Uh, you know, there's no taboos. You, you could bring up everything. 
because it's so important for us to clear the air and contextualize Tanya so that we should be able to see it and perceive it the way the author intended us to perceive it and use it as a manual for our daily lives in a practical way, not in a theoretical, abstract way that's completely detached from the 21st century. You know, I'm, <laughs> you know, one of the reasons we started this Zoom so late is because I had a share earlier on this evening. Right. Which was about uh, Chof Tevis and Chof Dalet Tevis, about the Rambam and the Alter Rebbe. And, um, you know, there's that Sicha, look at the Sicha Chelek Chovov, where the Rebbe speaks about commonalities between the Alter Rebbe and the, and the Rambam. And one of the amazing things, uh, I won't chaz the whole Sicha, but there's, there's a certain comparison made to the, the, the warning in the beginning of Meirah HaNevuchim, saying basically, you know, not just anybody can pick up this book. You have to, you have to qualify for it. And uh, it's, it's, it's worthwhile to learn the Sikha to see how the Rebbe deals with that. But in predictably, <laughs> in the Rebbe's all-inclusive style, the Rebbe is saying, that's not coming to exclude anyone. It's, it's coming to include. It's lifting the bar. It's showing you where you're going to be able to eventually reach through learning the Sefer. And then the Rebbe compares that to Hagdama Samalakit from, from the Tanya. And specifically the words the Rebbe Yezif Yitzchuk that you were just mentioning about Yeda and Makirai. And, and the Rebbe was saying, in so many words, you know, there are two vastly different ways of reading that phrase. One way is to say, oh, shoot, this book was written to people who went to Liajna or Liadi and they met the Alter Rebbe and they lived 200 years ago in white Russia and they had a different type of life. And maybe I could study this book as an anthropologist, but it's not written to me. That's one way you could read it. And the Rebbe says, no, no, no. <laughs> it's not that the Alter Rebbe only wrote this book to those who know him. It's, the, it's actually quite the reverse. That anyone who reads the book now becomes one who knows the Alter Rebbe. And I think that's a very important point that the Rebbe is making, which is that there's a personal relationship going on here. Um, the Alter Rebbe is reaching to you through these pages of this book, but just because you didn't live in white Russia 200 years ago, doesn't mean that you're not part of his circle. Quite to the contrary, the book is, is the tool for expanding the Alter Rebbe's circle of Yedai Umakirai. And uh, you know, that's obviously, you know, important to the Rebbe for a reason. It's, it's before you even find out what the Alter Rebbe says, it's important to feel that there's a real relation, a person, a personal relationship. I want to, I'm sorry for interrupting with a technical uh, announcement. The Zoom is full. So people are trying to get in, they can't get in. Um, I want to ask whoever is on Zoom, if you're not planning to write something on chat or unmute yourself, if you could just go to theyeshiva.net and tune in there, because over there the number is endless, we could have many people, so others who are trying to get onto Zoom could come onto Zoom. I'm sorry for the inconvenience, if you can go onto theyeshiva.net, where you have a direct stream from the Zoom, there's no difference, it's just a stream from the Zoom, so people could get onto the Zoom. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, Reb Shais. Anyways, yeah, so... But I've been Kalim for the Oedis. We need Kalim, so I'm sorry for... Uh... And somebody po just posted in the chat the uh, the link. Oh, thank you. To be able to go okay. to... The you chat. see that? Practical people, yeah. Okay, so... Um, you I set mean, the stage for what our agenda is, yes. at least, Be'ezer Hashem, to begin the journey. Right. And uh, to begin the journey, of course, Tanya is, uh, you know, a safer that uh, you could study for 70, 80 years and still not scratch the surface, but the journey has to begin. Okay, so let's, I'm going to suggest beginning with some generalities. Um, I've certainly seen this question asked, 
especially by those who studied Tanya in a in a in a in a school setting where like like like, like you were describing uh, sort of uh, being bored or turned off. There's there's a challenge to the whole notion of shtenefashis, not on a technical level, but more on a on a personal level of like, what are these? What's a nefesh? Like I understand the description, uh, nefesh alakis, nefesh abamis, but on a practical level, what does it feel like to experience my nefesh abamis? What does it feel like to experience my nefesh alakis? How do I know which one's talking? What does any of this actually look like in real life? Because I, I think the 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 estrangement from the text comes early on just from very basic concepts. If you're not relating to the what each nefesh is, that, that's it. The whole book from there on out is is only theoretical. Right. And the, and the first chapter he establishes as the foundation, quoting Reb Chaim Vital, that we each have two souls. So that's like the... So how would you, how would you uh, address that in very real, concrete, and relevant ways and really helping people in their daily lives? And if I may be tedious and, and speak about, you know, how it can help us navigate even those annoying moments that we all have. I, by the way, I just heard this great definition of, uh, of consciousness. What's the definition of consciousness? It's the annoying time between naps. So <laughs> that annoying time between naps, you know, we're triggered. You, you, your son's principal called you and spoke to you about your child and you, you lost it. Either you exploded or you're imploded. Your wife told you something. Your husband told you something. Your teenage girl told you something. Something happened at work. You missed your flight. <laughs> you're stuck in traffic. You have the flu. What, what is my nefesh of Bahamas talking in these situations? What is my nefesh of Lakis? Make it real for me. Yeah. Are you asking? I'm angry. Hey. I'm upset. Whatever. I think before you even talk about what's a nefesh abamis and what's a nefesh alakis, you have to define what's a nefesh. Okay. What's a nefesh? I mean, and if you're going to tell me, well, a nefesh is comprised of eser kaiches, and it expresses itself through three levoshim. I know that. That's what I read. That's what it says in chapter three and chapter four. What's this nefesh? It just uses the word nefesh as if that's a word that I relate to. Right. And, 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 and you, you, you tell me the end of chapter one, well, this, this first nefesh, it's in your blood. Okay. All right. Right. <laughs> What's a nefesh? So, I mean, I could tell you how, how I explain it to myself and make it relevant to myself. That's the best. <sighs> Nefesh is will. It's will. It's a drive. Like, misiras nefesh is misiras harotze. When we say to love Hashem, b'chol nafshecha, it means with all your will, with your desire. So I know what it means to want I know what it means to have a drive, maybe even call it an orientation, because a drive means I'm driven toward something. Once I can relate to it that way, um, then I can understand, well, then if I have two different nefashas, I have two different orientations. I have two different goals, or, or to call it a, a, a modus operandi. So then from there, you could tell me, well, one drive is driven toward this objective and the other drive is driven toward that objective. Once you tell me their drives, then you could tell me what they're driven toward. So then you could come in and explain to me, well, one drive 
is a selfish drive. Now, selfish is one of those misused words. I always say, well, what is selfish? It means that I ate all, I ate the last piece of pizza. I didn't, you know, I, I looked around, I saw other people standing around, I ate the last piece of pizza. That's what selfish is. <sighs> selfish means, in this term, self-perpetuation. And that's why it tells me it's the survival impulse that's embedded in my body and it keeps me alive. It's the will to survive. It's the will to not just that I should survive, but to propagate the species. So it's, uh, it's into that desire as well. And of course, I need to feed myself. And so that's all part of that desire as well. And uh, not to let anyone damage me or hurt me or threaten me. And when everything is functional and when my self-preservation drive is working, you know, is, is, is slim and fit and working just enough to keep me alive, everything's good, but then it exceeds its functionality and it becomes a, an impediment in my life. But its drive is fundamentally to keep me alive, to preserve me. And then I have another drive and its drive is not to preserve me which you could understand would pose a great threat, an existential threat to the drive whose entire modus operandi is to preserve me. But I have this other drive and its drive is not to preserve me. It's actually its drive. And I think this is a very important point. What's the drive of the Nafishela kiss? Not spiritual fulfillment, not spiritual fulfillment, because that's just another level of selfishness, albeit upgraded, more subtle, more lofty. But the drive of the nefesh alakis, and herein lies the conflict, whereas the nefesh of Bahamas, it's the drive for self-preservation. The nefesh alakis is the drive for self-annihilation. That sounds very scary. Self-annihilation, self-destruction. No, it's not destructive. It's the ultimately constructive drive for what we call, and here's the trigger word, bittel. I don't want to just be me. I want to be one with him. So the, the drive for self-preservation is I need to continue being me. And I'll do anything to fight anyone or anything that threatens me continuing to be me. And then the, the drive for uh, <clears throat> self-nullification or for uh, becoming subsumed in the oneness says, I would like to lose my private, separate sense of self and become united with the all. And, and, and when I think about it like that, I can relate to that being a conflict. I could start thinking about how that uh, would manifest itself in real life examples. Like, Forget about uh, the classic examples that the Mashpiyam use about the, the, you know, the, the cake or the ice cream. But you know, let's talk about the real drug, the real addiction, approval. That's, that's, the biggest, that's the biggest addiction is approval, validation, right? So my drive to be validated, my drive to be acknowledged, If I can identify that as, as self-seeking, and if I can identify that as, as the desire of my animal soul, as a, as a God-given uh, drive to, to preserve me and to do its job, to do its God-given job, um, it's not evil. We spoke about this at length on Yud Kislev. It's not evil. It's just trying to keep me alive. And I feel like if I don't get validated, I'll die. If I don't get attention, then I'll stop living. And if I could look at my godly soul as the desire to do the right thing without getting credit. You know, we all know how to sin without getting caught. This is called doing a mitzvah without getting caught. My godly soul wants to do a mitzvah without getting caught. You know, like the famous story of the previous Gilgul of the Baal Shem Tov, that beautiful story 
of the, the, the previous Gilgal of the Baal Shem Tov, the Tzadik Nister, who lived in Tzfas. There's a very beautiful Yom Tov Erlich song about it, by the way. But uh, his, his whole desire was to remain incognito. And he was very threatened by the, the idea he would get attention, even from Elio Anavi, he didn't want attention, right? So getting back to the, to the original question, what, what, what's a nefesh? A drive. What's a nefeshabamis? A drive for self-perpetuation. What's a nefeshalakis? A drive to become absorbed wholly in the absolute oneness. Where do those manifest themselves? Well, if I want people to look at me and affirm me, that's clearly coming from the first drive. If I want to just be connected to the right thing and lose myself in a cause bigger than myself, that's clearly the second drive. I would offer that for starters. Well, are the two essentially in conflict with each other? Not essentially in conflict, but you could understand that to begin with, their agendas are very different. They don't have, obviously, they don't, they don't have to be in conflict with each other because one of the main ideas of Tanya is to attenuate the conflict. So clearly, they, they're not essentially in conflict or there would be no resolution. And let's add that Tanya speaks about those individuals who actually create complete oneness where the two souls are not just getting along with each other, but they're completely unified. Right? There's an expression in Tanya that the Nefesh Abam is Nichlal Bikdushas Nefesh Alekis. It's completely one with the Nefesh Alekis, which is the Tzaddik. I have to throw out something. I heard this from the Rebbe in 1991. You know this? I think in the spring. The Rebbe said that when the Alter Rebbe said in Tanya that being a Tzaddik is not for everybody, he said, thus is far dixeris vahashmadas. In simple English, pre-Holocaust. Pre the horrific darkness that the Jewish people endured. After all of Jewish history and everything the Jewish people have been through, today, the consciousness of the tzaddik is relevant to every Jew. <laughs> so, That's you really heavy. Done. I you heard this from the Rebbe's done. mouth. Huh? But you realize what you've done now. People were hanging on to two words, halavai benini, which was their license that they're never even going to become a benini. And now you told them that Ebba said they could be a tzaddik? They're happy that the Sefer Shel Tzaddikim got burnt. <laughs> and now you're telling them that the Rebbe turned Sefer Shel Benenim into a Sefer Shel Tzaddikim. Yeah. Which, by the way, I believe that he did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, in the, the Maimah Bilo Amovus Lenetzach, when the Rebbe speaks about everybody having a tzaddik area or moment or experience. Yeah. Yeah. The Rebbe really took, expanded the definitions way beyond what, I don't know how they learned Tanya and Der Rishon. I don't know how the Alter Rebbe's Chassidim learned it, but after uh, you learn the Rebbe's Sichus and Maimorim, you get the idea that <laughs> the, uh, it, 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 this, I'll let you defend this statement. I'm going to make an, a radical statement. I'll let you defend it. On one hand, the Rebbe recontextualizes Tanya in the most inclusive possible way, with the broadest, most liberal definitions possible to bring everyone in, and at the same exact time, raises the bar even beyond what it seems the Alter Rebbe was doing. Go ahead and defend that statement. <laughs> so, I, I, I want to, I threw in the tzaddik piece because I think we'll have, we're going to have to bring it together. But, but so let's go to these two souls, okay? I have an animal consciousness, an Efesha Bahamas, I have an Efesha Likis. Do you notice that throughout Tanya, the Alter Rebbe has different words. He has Nefesha Chiyunis, he has Nefesh Bahamas, right? I think twice he uses Nefesh HaSichlis and Nefesh HaLikis. <laughs> the biological soul, right? Or the vivifying soul 
the animal consciousness, right? The, the soul of the mammal, the rational consciousness, and the divine consciousness. Now, I don't know why, but I had a thought, and, and, and correct me, argue with me, tell me I'm wrong, tell me I'm right, tell me I'm almost right. That what Alter Rebbe is describing more than anything else in Tanya, and I, and I really believe this, if you're reading Tanya as a book of judgment, close it. Because you're not reading the Alter Rebbe's Sefer. The Alter Rebbe is trying to be here for every learner of the Tanya in the most loving and powerful way. And the best way you can be here for a person is by offering them the deepest form of self-awareness. There's nothing like a mentor, like a teacher, like a parent, like a, like a Rebbe, who invites you into your own deepest levels of self-awareness. That's the antithesis of judgment. It's actually giving you choices. It's helping you become aware of what is going on in your brain, what is going on in your psyche, what is going on in your heart, what you're experiencing. Because in the confusion and the chaos of all of my emotions and sensations, I don't know what I'm experiencing. I don't know who I am. I don't know what's going on. And that's a very slippery slope to despondency and depression and, and addiction and, and laziness and all other things that are not very productive. But when there is real self-awareness, without judgment, just real self-awareness, really seeing the dynamics and literally getting an x-ray into your soul, is there a greater gift than that? So every page of Tanya, especially those first chapters, he's literally trying to open you up and give you a CAT scan and an x-ray into our inner workings into who we are, what we want, what we struggle with, the various conflicts that exist in us, where they come from. So when you can have awareness of what is happening inside of you, then you are empowered to make choices. You could see the various options and you can also embrace all parts of yourself because you see where they come and you realize that all of them serve some form of divine purpose. And I think on some level, these two souls is that very, very deep understanding of two aspects that every single one of us has. And if I may use a term that I can't say I understand well, but we spoke about this at our Yutas Kislev Abrengen last month, and that is today in neuroscience, they speak about different layers of the brain. The stem of the brain, the first part of the brain, which they call the reptilian brain, the amygdala. It's literally called the brain of the reptile. It's the common denominator that I and you have with reptiles. All reptiles, small crocodiles and big crocodiles, benign alligators and dangerous alligators. And then we have a limbic brain, a, a, an emotional brain, <laughs> very much a brain of the mammal. Then we have the prefrontal cortex where there is long-term thinking, where a person could see different sides, where a person can consider different options, where a person can think about right and wrong, long-term relationships, delaying gratification, seeing paradoxes, appreciating things from different perspectives, noticing various forces going on. What are these really? What are these really? Today they speak about trauma in the sense that parts of our brain actually freeze. And if you are in a continuous state of trauma, part of my brain is literally not functioning. I can't even make choices because I'm stuck. I'm sometimes stuck in my amygdala. I am stuck in my reptile. I am busy surviving. And I'm constantly or very often on alert. My fire alarms are sounding constantly because I'm completely stuck and frozen. My reptile is not bad. As you said, my reptile is here to help me survive. My amygdala is here to alert me to danger so that I could survive, which is God's purpose and God's function. But what often happens is, is in the words of Tanya, my nefesh Bahamas, my poor little nefesh Bahamas, is so frightened, is so overwhelmed. And I don't even know about another dimension in my life. I don't even know about the expansive opportunities I have in my life. 
So now the two souls are in such conflict because one is completely relegated to dormancy. I have no, no access to it. So is the Alter Rebbe really helping me tune in to what is going on with every thought, with every word, with every action, with every sensation, with every emotion, so that I can trace it back and I can identify which part of my brain, which part of my consciousness is now ruling, <laughs> ruling the terrain and how I am responding to it. And when I can really, really do that, and I can open myself up to the possibility that so much of me has been disconnected from me, that so much of me has shut down in my body, in my brain, isn't that the genesis of, of all healing, of, of all redemptiveness? You know, I just to echo what you're saying, yes, and um, I'm not aware of any instructions or directions in the first prokim. I mean, Tanya is chiefly an instructive book. It's a manual. And yet, if for sure, in the first eight prokim, we're just learning what you called self-awareness or self-knowledge. He didn't tell us to do anything. Like even the fact that he told us, for instance, in chapter three, that the middays come from uh, the, 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 the meichen. He didn't tell us to go be misbeinen. He'll tell us later. He didn't tell us yet. Uh, the fact that he tells us in chapter four that uh, there's something called levusha hanefesh and it's not mahus hanefesh. He didn't tell us, and therefore focus on your behaviors. He'll tell us that later. The, but at, at, in the beginning chapters, it's purely self knowledge, and and one has to believe that there's a certain degree of relief that just comes from knowing the nature of your condition. In other words, let me set the scene. I mentioned before that anyone who learns Tanya is Yehuda Makirai of the Alter Rebbe, which is not my idea. It's, I, I would, obviously, I wouldn't take uh, liberties to say such a thing. But I, I'll, I'll add to that. And it was something, actually, I didn't notice that the Rebbe was assigned to this in that Sikha from uh, uh, Lekut Yisikha's uh, Chavav. But there's a Tere Sholem where the, the, the Rebbe Rashab says in a Sikha that everyone who learns Tanya is having Yechidus with the Alter Rebbe because Tanya was written as a uh, yechidus in paper form. So literally, you're, you're in Yechidus. So I imagine it like a story. I'm standing outside, and I'm pacing around, and I'm about to enter in the Alter Rebbe's room, and I'm about to pour out my guts. And I don't even know what's wrong with me, because I haven't learned any Tanya yet. I don't know Shtei Nefoshis. I know nothing, not even the most basic concepts. All I know is I want to serve Hashem, I mean, he, he, Tanya is not there to convince me to want to serve Hashem. Tanya, is, it says in the Hagdama, to someone who's been trying and failing. So all I know is I want to serve Hashem. I'm not consistently successful at it. Um, I'm baffled. I'm baffled. I don't even know why. Am I a hypocrite? Am I a liar? Am, am I evil? Am, am, I, am, I, am, I, am, I, am I fundamentally broken? Am I constitutionally incapable? Like, what's up? And I go into the Alter Rebbe, and at least the first Yechidus is just the relief of being given some insight into my inner workings. Before I've been told to do anything about that, there's a relief that comes from just understanding why I am this way that I am. And therefore, I now have the opportunity to be able to make choices from a place of wholeness, <laughs> from a place of expansiveness. Which is Can the I next always, step. Huh? Which is the next step. Which is the next step. Can it's I become a... Step. And to, to become aware that that nefesh ali kiss which is the divine consciousness, is basically that at my core, I am a derivative of the infinite consciousness of divine oneness. And, and my deepest ambition, therefore, my deepest craving is to be a full manifestation of that infinite oneness, of the infinite love and oneness of Hashem Echad. 
my reactions, my sensations, my relationships, my daily encounters, how I think, how I speak, how I live, how I experience myself. In, in, in the model of the tzaddik, the animal consciousness and the divine consciousness yes or no? are perfect. What's going on? Rabbi Yosef, can you uh, mute, mute? You can hear me, Rabbi Shais. You can hear me? But I don't hear you. Now you hear me. Oh, okay. So, so in the case of the tzaddik, the, the, the two souls are in, in perfect harmony with each other because the animal soul at its core, and this is the Alter Rebbe's reason, I assume, that he doesn't use so much the word Yetzahara or Ra, even though he does use the word, but the main word is the animal consciousness because an animal is not evil, <laughs> right? Your puppy is not evil. Your sheep or your goat or your ox is not evil. <laughs> They're actually it wants, to survive. Survive. it wants to survive. It wants to survive. And and, and that, that was God's plan. <laughs> right? We well, cherish I'll tell you something. The huh? Nefesh Malakis doesn't want to survive. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, and I think this is a very important <clears throat> point because I don't want to harp on this, but I mentioned earlier, a lot of people think of the Nefesh Malakis as simply the Nefesh Bamas with better taste. So the Nefesh Bamas likes greasy pizza and the Nefesh Alakis likes the brick oven pizza with the goat cheese. It's got better taste, right? In other words, Nefesh Bamas wants Tanuga Elam Haza and the Nefesh Alakis wants spiritual Tanugim. And, and there are <laughs> approaches to Yiddishkeit which characterize our deepest spiritual desire in this manner of, and, 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 and in fact, describe Hashem's greatest desire is the desire to bestow this pleasure upon us, this nenim ziva shchina experience. But in Tanya, it's, a, it's, it's quite different. Um, and you, you know, you find it a lot in Perig Yud with B'nai Aliyah, the, what, what their, their selflessness. But then later on, he even says, that that level, that selflessness, Kibrod Yishtadal, he says later, that's for Abenini as well. Um, 41. Yeah. So the selflessness of the Nefesh Alakis is not simply to say that, well, the Nefesh Abamis, it wants coarse pleasures, and the Nefesh Alakis wants more refined pleasures. No, no, no. Then they're not even opposites. Then they're just they're, they're the same thing. They're both selfish. Just one's got better taste. The nefesh abamis is self-preservation. Nefesh alakis, and this is a scary word. Maybe there's a better word for it. Is self-annihilation. You know, Freud spoke about a death wish. You know, he spoke about everyone wants to just blot out their existence. In, in, from a from a place of kedusha, what does that mean? It's not, God forbid, self-destructive. It's certainly not self-hatred because self-hatred is also self-oriented. It's also self-obsession. It means I don't, want the e- I don't want the ego acting as an interruption between me and my real identity, which is the oneness. oneness. Right. So now look at it like this. I have a penchant for self-preservation and a penchant to absolutely lose myself in, in the oneness, of course, not just to lose myself, Stam. I, I also think that's an important point, that anytime you use the word bittel, the word bittel on its own is an incomplete thought. You always have to define bittel to what? <laughs> bittel to what? So if I'm bottle to something, I become one with that thing. If the drop of milk falls in the big pot of meat, it becomes as if it were just more meat. If I'm bottle, it's not bottle, that's not a complete thought. Bottle to Hashem means I am now one with Hashem. So it's the, look, I, I, look, I shall Adam come I say. Which is a beautiful right example of that. As beautiful I, I am I am an embodiment. I am an embodiment of of divine infinity. So you become much more powerful. It's a different right. type of power. 
It's not the ego power. I, I'm sure you've seen that uh, it was printed actually recently in, in the in the De Hair magazine, but it's been floating around for a while. There was a, a program that they made for the Pegisha, for the encounter with Chabad, for the college uh, weekend. And um, they wrote up the topics. It was in English, and they wrote it up, and they, they submitted it to the Rebbe. And one of the, the lecture topics, was, and I liked it. I thought it was a good topic. <laughs> I could have written this, you know, like, and, and I would have been very proud of myself. Was, I think the name of the topic was Bittel, the Quest for Nothingness. And yeah, the Rebbe didn't like that. The Rebbe put like a question mark on the word nothingness, like nothing, quest for, for nothingness. So I actually, I, I spoke to uh, Rebbe Shmuel Lu, who was involved in that pagisha and submitting the program. I'm not sure if he was the one who wrote it, but he was definitely involved in, in planning the program. And I asked him, like, what, what, what was, I mean, I had my, presumptions what the Rebbe's objection might be, but I wanted to hear it from him. So he said one thing that I actually hadn't thought of. Um, one thing which, which was obvious to me, which is Bittel isn't a quest to be nothing. <laughs> it's a quest to be one with everything, with the all, right? But something else he pointed out to me, and I guess it's because I wasn't thinking in terms of the zeitgeist of, this is the 1960s, he said there was a lot of existentialism and a lot of, you know, the philosophers who were basically posing the question, what's the point of it? There's no point to anything. Right. And he didn't want that nihilism of like, at the end of it all, what's it all about? It's about right. nothing, right? So Bittel can't mean- Maybe they had to write the quest for no thingness. Oh, the space, but yeah, yeah, that's that's what it is. That would have been, yeah, <laughs> so yes, yesh me ayin, as the Alter Rebbe says, we come from ayin, from no thingness, no from thingness, and, and that's nefesh alikis. Don't, don't keep me stuck in thingness, in, in, in the concrete box of, of the shells of reality. <laughs> Because the deeper you go into even physics, we know that thingness is just the perception of our retina incapable of, of defining the infinity that's vibrating through matter. Now you get into a whole discussion of materialism, which I think... You cannot teach Tanya in 2021, almost 2022, without discussing the worldview called materialism. And by materialism, I don't mean conspicuous consumption, which is a symptom of materialism. But by materialism, I mean a worldview, a reductionist worldview that would basically... Um, reduce all reality to, to physicality. In other words, if it's not physical, it's not real. Uh, if I can't empirically experience it, test it, scientific observation, it's not real, right? A complete rejection of anything that is metaphysical. Well, another yeah. quote, quote Alter Rebbe in, in the third chapter of Shara Yichud Vemuna, if to say it in English, Alter Rebbe is saying, if our eyes would be spiritually microscopic, right, we would perceive in the matter no right. thingness, right? That's right. what we would perceive. Right. The nefesh is is in tune to that. The nefesh is is a divine consciousness. It's in tune to that reality. So another way of saying so the nefesh I, I, when you say self myolation, I know that's the translation, but I find that there's forgive me. Uh, by the way, I never saw that anyone trauma. translated it that way. There's too much trauma. So I, but I want to tell you that <laughs> I actually never saw anybody translate itself no? annihilation. Okay. No, I know no, this is not a sikh as an English translation. I, I'm saying self-annihilation. Now I, and I and I and I when I said it, I said it's a trigger word. I, well, bitl itself is a trigger word, I think I said. So I know it's scary. I would like to reclaim that term. You know, it's like saying, I don't want to study the Bible because the Christians study the Bible. 
I would like to reclaim the term bittel because I think that freedom from the bondage of self is the most beautiful thing there could of be. Of course. Of course. And the Nefjabamas, my penchant for self preservation, is begging me, screaming in terror, don't do it, Chase. Don't do anything that will threaten our existence. And, and I'm trying to convince him, Behemala, it's going to be so good. Yeah. It's going to be. So we good. have to soothe him. But we can't, you have to soothe him. You got to soothe the animal. Isn't that in chapter nine, you know, the Altarebbe keeps, people don't realize the subtleties in Tanya. When the Altarebbe speaks about the cravings of the animal soul, he'll often identify which element it comes from. Like, right, the taivas, me yisoyed hamayim. Right. You said in chapter one, the four elements. I got it. I remember chapter right. What's one. What's this Neoplatonism? How is it serving me? But, but, but I think it's critical because... He's always saying, tune in. The animal is, is searching for something. The animal is trying to survive. <laughs> he has an element of water. He has an element of earth. This is, this is what his entity is. You can't just destroy him and make believe he doesn't exist. In that sense, the Tanya is the most compassionate book because it says you can have compassion on every part of yourself. It's serving a purpose. And, and when you know that, you can begin a conversation with your animal soul. You won't worship it. You won't surrender to it. You'll begin a conversation with it. And when you will ultimately identify what it's searching for, you can actually sublimate it because it will not, it will not resist your journey for oneness because real oneness doesn't destroy. Real oneness is actually aligning yourself with reality. So, so living with my nefesh Bahamas without my nefesh kiss, it's not just not spiritual. It's it's emotionally, I am imprisoned. I'm really imprisoned. I'm in such a restricted, narrow place. I, 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 some people, I'm living in a fight or flight or freeze moment. I, I'm frozen. I'm just frozen. <laughs> I can't even feel. Forget about think. I can't connect. I can't connect with me. I'm disassociated, and therefore I have to numb my pain. So I go binging. <laughs> Chapter 7, the Altarebbe has this thing with food. A lot of people find it very difficult. You know, ice cream, cheesecake, it's like sholosh tepasat meyes. What does a Shabbos table look like from a perspective of Chapter 7? Can you tell me? <laughs> well, he says that's one of the hetedim. <laughs> That's true. Shabbos. Yeah. When I started, when I became, I was a, a mashpia in, in yeshiva in Chayu Vetaira on Eastern Parkway. So when I <laughs> when I got the job, Rabbi Yisrael Lapkovsky hired me. <laughs> so there was a mashpia, an older mashpia, who came over to me. And he said, I'm just going to tell you one story. There was Rabbi Alta Simchavich. Rabbi Alta Simchavich was a Tomim, he learned in Lubavitch by the Rebbe Rashab, and he was considered one of the, you know, the gems, the gems of, of the Talmudim of the Rashab. He became the Mashpi of Teres Emes in Yerushalayim. And the Rebbe Rayatz asked him to become a Mashpi in Warsaw in time Chitmim in the 30s. I think he was there for one or two years. He died very young in 1939. Reb Alta Simchavich. So Reb Alta, <laughs> Reb Alta, uh, I think the story was told by Rabbi Tzuntz. It was Rabbi Zuntz, who was in Warsaw. And he said, the Polish Shabochim, they heard about Rabbi Alters. They thought, you know, Friday night, they'll, he'll wait till after davening, and he'll get to have the Friday night meal with Rabbi Alters and Chavich, you know, the private meal. And then the next day, you could tell your friends, you know, you had so the Shabbos with Rabbi Alter. He didn't realize Rabbi Alters and Chavich davened Friday night for four hours. For four hours. The poor boy was waiting four hours, but he thought, ah, he's going to come home. There's going to be a Shabbos meal, you know, Polish style, Polish style. They come home. And Reb Alter takes out a bulkala. He makes Kiddush. He takes out a little herring. <laughs> he, gives, he gives the bacha herring he eats. And then he prepares for benching. And the boy, the Polish boy who grew up in the ambiance of, of Polish jury says, Reb Alter, it's Shabbos. A bulkala with a piece of herring. 
and he looks at him and he says, for a mashpia and time chitmimim, is das oich to fill. Yes, the edelkeit of the other. For a mashpia and time chitmimim, this is also excessive. <laughs> it's also excessive. But, 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 but I want to sweeten this up, and I, I want to say that what I'm, what, and tell me, tell me if this is not the deepest form of self-awareness. Why do I eat potato chips? Why do I eat Danishes? I'm not the slimmest guy in the world. Why? When I'm in a place of wholeness, emotional, spiritual, psychological, physical wholeness, do I eat things that are not good for my body? Does anybody? Isn't that a form of desperation? <laughs> Am I not trying to numb my pain? Am I not trying to fill my void? Am I not trying to escape? All the Alter Rebbe is telling you is, realize when you're taking a bite of food, first of all, there's cosmic significance. You're not a small person. Every act matters. But also tune into what is happening. Which voice is taking over? Which dimension of your brain, of your consciousness, is running the show? Is it your expansive, divine, infinite consciousness, which includes all parts of your brain as accessories to serve Hashem and become part of Enoid Mulvadai? Or am I stuck in a very primitive, reptilian state of consciousness? Isn't that great self-awareness when you're eating? <clears throat> so here, here's what I would offer to you. It all depends how I find that information out. Who tells me and why? In other words, let's say somebody came to a point where um, they their addiction to food was literally uh, threatening their life, threatening to kill them. And they, in absolute desperation, knowing that they, they know it's killing them, their doctor told them they're dying, God forbid, and they can't stop. And they're sitting in front of an open refrigerator weeping, Weeping because they know this is killing them and they can't stop because they have no other tool for dealing with stress. They have no other tool for, for, for coping with life. This is their only comfort, their only distraction. And they drag themselves in absolute desperation to a 12-step meeting of Overeaters Anonymous, to OA. And they sit down and an old timer sits across them and says, you need God. You need a higher power because right now your best efforts to manage your own life are killing you and you need to turn it over and you need to surrender. And when you're going to surrender, you're going to, if eating will drastically change. You will no longer eat as a coping mechanism because you're going to realize you don't need those coping mechanisms. You're, you're going to allow Hashem to take care of you or they'll call it a higher power, I'll allow a higher power to take care of you, and you're going to turn your will and your life over to the care of God. And from then on, you're going to be free from this need to self-medicate through the distraction of the pleasure of eating. And they're going to hear that as a godsend. They're going to, they're going to weep with joy. I just got the good news. I'm free from this hell. I'm free from this hell. Now, you take a 15-year-old who likes pizza, likes ice cream, isn't a food addict, isn't even on the way to becoming one, doesn't have an eating disorder, and you tell them this piece of information one evening in a Tanya year, and it's like, whoa, this is way too intense. I would argue the information itself is not too intense. And my greatest proof for that would be if you would take that addict, that food addict who comes into an OA meeting and hears this news and weeps with tears of joy about the good news that I don't have to live this hell anymore. But if they, that same person would have come to that meeting a month earlier, they also would have said, you guys are crazy. That's way too intense. I'll diet. 
Don't tell me, give my life and will over to the care of God. I'll die it. So that person who's ready to fully embrace the idea of eating L'Shem Shemayim for the rest of their life would have rejected it a month earlier. So one of my arguments is that you have to know where and when to place these messages. And that, that's first of all. And secondly, that if you are going to tell these things to someone who's not yet at the point of desperation, you know, Abi Ibn, the great diplomat, once said that nations are like people. They tend to behave rationally after they have exhausted all other possibilities. Okay. So if I'm still, quote unquote, functional, right? I'm not experiencing any unmanageability. I haven't lost my life, my reputation, my health, my, my good name to this taiva. And for that matter, by the way, Rabbi Yezif Yitzchak, you're mentioning the food in Perek Zion. We could also mention the, uh, the other tithes that are mentioned in Perek Zion. Intimacy. Of sexual nature. Intimacy. Yeah, intimacy. So also, you know, you tell that to a 15-year-old who has regular struggles with that, if you would take somebody who comes to an SA meeting uh, and, and they would hear that same message, they would weep with tears of joy. I'm free from this hell. There's hope. There's deliverance. I can actually live a life free from having to numb myself with this distraction. So what, what I'm saying is the message itself is not too intense but it has to be delivered <laughs> in the right context. And if someone's not ready for it yet, I think we have to be honest and say to them, look, this is a message that's pretty darn appealing to somebody who is at the end of their rope. Now, your life is still functional. Your life is still manageable. How can we present this idea to you without sounding like we fell off the moon. And I think there are ways. I think there are ways of, and again, this is, a, this is going to be tr uh, triggering, but I think there are ways of helping people to embrace unmanageability with dignity and to realize that unmanageability, we could raise the bottom, so to speak, that we can embrace our un the unmanageability of our lives as they are right now. We don't have to fall to rock bottom before we're welcoming this good news. But I, 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 I think a lot of this has to do with context. A lot of it has to do with getting a person primed and ready for the message. Otherwise, you just hit them with these statements and they sound absolutely intense and, and radical and, and unrealistic. You know, I, I heard a, a beautiful story Rabbi Chaim Moshe Berkstein from Detroit. It's such a, a powerful story. He was a university student. And I think he went to Kal Torah and he ultimately ended up in Kfar Chabad. And he was a student of Rabbi Shalem Chaim Kesselman, who was the Mashpi of Kfar Chabad. He had learned in Lubavitch. And Rabbi Shalem Chaim would often talk about Eskafia, which is, of course, a common phrase in Tanya. How do we translate Eskafia? Right? subjugation, right? You, you subdue your animal soul. You subdue your animal cravings. As is you transform. But as is you subdue. And, and I'm quoting him. He said, and I started to walk around with tremendous anxiety, tremendous guilt and self-loathing. Oh, I ate this. It was inappropriate. I had this thought. It was inappropriate. I had this craving. It was inappropriate. Never mind if you committed a sin. And was my Iskafi and Abshalom Chaim would demand the boys to challenge themselves, you know, to discipline themselves, real Iskafi. And he said he became an emotional mess. He was a miserable person. He was full of anxiety. Those are his words. And I said, I looked at the other Hasidim, including people who were talking about Iskafi, and they seemed very happy and relaxed. And I couldn't understand. How can you be a relaxed person and believe in Iskafi? In 1969, he went on Yechidus. I think it was his 23rd birthday, somewhere that zip code. And he shared this with the Rebbe about his insane anxiety that comes from Eskafia. And he says that the Rebbe told him, you completely misunderstand Eskafia. You got it all wrong. He said, that's what the Rebbe told him. You got it all wrong. 
And he explained to him what iskafi is. Iskafi does not mean that you are living in a state of anxiety, suppressing what you want. Iskafia means, and I'm going to quote the Rebbe's words that he repeated on Yechidus. The Rebbe said, Ervil habin de gilui oir for the nefesh elikis, viler nisht, nis balbal veren mit zachen was velnam nisht geben dem gilui oir. Which Allow me to translate it. Allow me to translate it into English. <laughs> if I come in the morning to shul, in our shul they have a lot of cake, and there's good cheesecake in the morning, and I want it. I have a sweet tooth. I want the cheesecake. There's only one problem. My father died from diabetes. My uncles died from diabetes. And when I eat sugar in the morning, I get depressed. I get into a bad mood. Okay, but I want the cheesecake. So now I tell myself, I don't want to be in a depression today. I want a flow of energy. I want my adrenaline. I want to I want to maximize my potentials today. Therefore, I will not surrender to this instinct that I want to eat the cake because I have a vision of who I am, of who I want to be, and what I could be. So what the Rebbe was telling Rabbi Bergstein is, Iskafi is not crushing yourself. It's liberating yourself from the need to subject yourself to this instinct that's going to turn you into a slave. It's seeing yourself in a much more expansive place, identifying the craving, seeing where it comes from, some deep addiction or instinct that for me means survival in some way, even though it's not that way. You know, there's something it's giving me. I could, I could soothe it, I can calm it down, and I say, but, but you, you, really, you really can't define me. I'm not going to let you define me. So it's a very liberate. It's a very liberating experience. How, how could you live without this in a successful way? So, echoing this this idea of Skafia as liberation, um, you know, there's a tikkun that the Rebbe makes in Perek Zion, which is absolutely, I think, the longest amendment. In the Tukun of it's yeah. like uh, it's like three, four lines long. Uh, in, in, I mean, those are they're narrow little columns, but it's very long. It's very long, and um, it's <laughs> it's surprising to many people. But there, it, where he's discussing, so we're talking about eating, but there, there's there's certain desires people have for other physical desires for for intimate union. And of course, he speaks about Zedel of Atala, but also he speaks about, and the Rebbe adds there, that, that amendment, the pleasure that he seeks in union with his wife, who is pure, meaning there's, <laughs> there's no aspect of prohibition here whatsoever. It's his wife. She's not a nida. It's everything's good. Check the list. There's no halachic issues here. And yet he does it for the, for the animalistic pleasure of the, the physical experience. Okay. So let's, let's pretend that it doesn't say that in Tanya. Let's, let's set aside our discussion of Tanya. A husband comes to you and he says, Rabbi Jacobson, I have a problem. My wife and I, we fight a lot. One of my problems is I feel that she doesn't value me. She doesn't respect me. Um, and, and, and I feel absolutely devastated by this because I feel that I really need her to, to recognize me. And I feel utterly rejected and I feel estranged from her. And, uh, and this is my problem. And you let the guy talk. And after a while, he says to you, and you want to know another problem is that my needs in the marital area are exceeding hers. And she's not available for me to the extent that I want. And this really, really upsets me. And uh, I feel so resentful about this, I, I, this, 
there's something I need, and she's not giving it to me. And well, well, I'm, I am constructing a hypothetical scenario that is com- a composite of probably hundreds of real life conversations right now. And I would bet that my hypothetical scenario rings somewhat familiar with you. You've heard this type of talk before. And it occurs to you, you say to this younger man, it sounds like you're actually very angry. You're you're resentful how dependent you are on your wife. You're you're angry at her. You resent her because she has something you want and you you can't get it. And it's validation. And, And one of the primary ways where that validation is being withheld from you is you want to be you want her to be available to you in certain ways, okay? And that's causing you to feel disrespected and that's causing you to feel rejected, okay? So one solution would be, let's go, you know, demean her, objectify her, yell at her and tell her that she should be available to you, uh, you know, at your beck and call. Another approach would be, are you ready to search within yourself and ask yourself, how did you get to the point where you enslaved yourself so much to this, where now your relationship with your wife has become one where she's your drug dealer and you're calling her at three in the morning to, to, to score and she's not available? How dare my drug dealer not answer the phone at three in the morning? Because I, I need my fix. So now there's no love. There's no respect. There's no genuine intimacy. There's just a commoditization of the relationship where I'm the buyer, you're the seller. How dare you not sell to me what what I'm trying to buy over here? Imagine if you could tell this person, there's a way to unhinge yourself from this dependency. There's a way where you can still be a husband, and have a physical relationship. And not only you can, you should, but you can do it selflessly. You can do it as a giver. And you can no longer need to seek that wholeness, that validation that you're chasing in your physical relationship with your wife, which will never actually give that to you because really the wholeness you seek, like you called it, is what was the Lushen? The Rebbe told Bergstein? The the air, the, the Gilu air. You, you you don't want to lose the gili oil for the nefesh. In other words, kiss. there's a gili oil yeah. that you could be having. Right. You're trying to get it through oh. this pleasure, and you've now enslaved yourself to it, and now you're resentful. You're resentful because you 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 you're 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 a slave, and it's destroyed your relationship with her, and really even deeper than that, it destroyed your relationship with yourself. And if you can let go of those needs and say, you know what, I'm not a slave to this, then you can have a relationship with your wife on every level, emotional and physical and spiritual and every other level, without it being (laughs) an an, an obstruction upon the giloyoy. So what I'm saying is, If somebody came to, again, I'm just, I'm merely saying context is everything. If a guy came to you and he was ready to admit or be led to a point where he could admit that my desire for the pleasure of marital union has destroyed my relationship with my wife and my relationship with my very own self, and then I need to unhinge myself from that dependency so I could actually be present in marital intimacy, then you would open up Perek Zion of Tanya and show him the Rebbe's Ha'ara, and he would be thrilled. He would say, this is such a gift. This is such good news. This is so liberating. But you tell it to the wrong person at the wrong time, in the wrong way, and they feel oppressed and they feel judged. That's what I'm saying. Right. So I think this, this also brings us to another fascinating point, which I think people don't realize. The Alter Rebbe is often using the word klipa, right? Right away in chapter one, there's a soul that comes from klipa, and he'll repeat this. Nefesh HaBahamas, Shemitzad HaKlipa, Bechalal HaSmoili, Hamali Dam. 
Okay, I got it. Every time you have to say it again and again, it comes from Klippa. It's in the left ventricle, by the way. It's not in the right ventricle. It's in the left ventricle. It's on the left side. Just know where the guy is. Know where he is. And I think here again, we often miss the profound beauty and love in these words. What does the word Klippa mean? The word Klippa is the deepest term for self-awareness. Klippa means a blockage, a cover-up, a husk, a shell. In other words, I may be operating on a level of consciousness which is, by definition, covering up the fundamental truth of existence, right? What's the fundamental truth of existence? The truth of existence is that I am an embodiment of infinity. And deep, deep down, my animal ultimately is also an embodiment of infinity. But in a very limited world, and in a world where there's pain and danger, it turns into this klipa, which covers up who it really is, and who I really am, and who we really are. So my work with my animal soul consists of two steps. First of all, identifying voices that are really, con- they're comprised of blockages. They're protecting something. They're covering something. They're not giving me full access. I want, I want full access to me. And when I can do that, when I can do that, I can then look what is beneath the klipa. And that's where transformation happens. So perhaps the word klipa is a very, very rich term because it gives us a sweeping perspective on how to be able to identify what is going on in me. Any thought, any word, any action, any sensation, any emotion that eclipses the truth of oneness, that tells me that I am detached, isolated, disconnected, I need validation in order to exist. In other words, I'm a broken person. Isn't that covering up the truth that I am part of the infinite light? And now I can choose. I can choose to see it as a cover-up and to have compassion on it and then to say, where do I want to direct my energy? What do I want to choose at this moment? How to live, how to have intimacy, how to speak to somebody, how to respond to your accusations, how to enter into this conversation. Will I become consumed with the cover-ups? In other words, I become part of the problem or I could become part of the solution because I have that grander perspective that can see what is going on inside of me. And I would add that just like we were talking about before that the animal soul is a necessary impulse for self-preservation, that a clipper also fulfills a necessary function. The banana peel is essential to the banana, the orange peel, the walnut. In fact, Chassidus brings from Kabbalah Klippa Kadma Lepri. The Nachash, the ultimate Klippa, was supposed to be, it says in Sanhedrin, a Shamash Gadol. He was supposed to be a Shamash, a servant, an accessory. The, the Klippa is not bad. That's the point, right? The Klippa is there as an accessory to protect the fruit. What happens is, from Klippas Neiga, which is translucent, in other words, it allows itself to be sublimated. It could become a dense shell that eclipses there's anything inside of it. So instead of my brain, my amygdala, and my limbic brain, my reptilian brain, and my mammal brain becoming translucent and saying, I'm here for you. <laughs> I'm here for you, uh, neo prefrontal. I'm here for you, nefesh asichlis. I'm here for you, nefesh alikis. I'm here for you. I'm standing guard. <laughs> I'm going to make sure this world is a safe place so we can introduce oneness. It takes over my life. I don't even know about anything else. So when 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 somebody wrote to me, somebody wrote to me an email. He says he's been through a lot of pain in his life. Mm. He's been abused. And he wrote to me, I went to Tanya for so many years. I now find no use in it because there's not even once the mention of the word trauma in Hebrew. 
There's not a once. And to deal with my trauma, I had to go to other sources. And there's nothing there for a person like me who has been living with trauma and only other sources, first of all, help me be aware of it and help me release it. This was a very scathing email, but also one with a lot of pain. If I would see it at the surface, if I would look at it from a Klippa perspective, mm. it was a very vindictive email. Underlying it, it was, underlying the shell, it was a very emotional email. Now, forgive me if I'm wrong, but I see the word trauma, <laughs> maybe, you know, maybe my Oma Shagas, I see the word trauma in every chapter of Tanya. <laughs> The nefesh of Bahamas, divorce from the nefesh of Lakis, is, is living trauma. The beauty of the Bainani, the beauty of the Bainani is <clears throat> that he or she is not the perfect person. He or she is the person who has blockages, but simply identifies them. <laughs> they have blockages. And sometimes their heart is overtaken by, by terrible pain or conflict or loneliness. There are moments of davening, there's moments of ecstasy, there's moments of, of oneness, of, of, of unity, but there's moments of, of, of fragmentation on many different levels. The Altar Rebbe once said that there's 500 levels in the Bainani. <laughs> yeah. But the common denominator is that the Bainani of Tanya, the Altar Rebbe, and I think that's one of the incredible ideas of Tanya and where judgmentalism is so far from it. We're in other books of ethics. You know, you'll have the tzaddik or the rasha, right? And you have to fit into one of them. And the Alter Rebbe creates a new man, a new model. Say for Shalbein in them. I'm not going to put you into this box. I'm not going to put you into that box. It's not going to happen. And I have to say something else. You know, many people over the generations, Rabbi Yadin Evan Yisrael brings this out in his introduction to Tanya. He says, over the generations, most books of ethics demanded complete identification with spiritual goals. And when you could not, one of two things happened. Either you became cynical or you became false. And I think it still happens today in certain communities where I try to aspire to become a certain person. And when I'm not, either I become fake which means I'm not real, I'm not authentic anymore because I have to fit in, so I can't be honest, or I just detach, I become cynical. You meet constantly people who grew up in very religious and Hasidic and yeshivish communities, and there is such a deep cynicism, right? What is it coming from? It's just a complete lack of identification with the material. It's just so not real. One of the most beautiful, what I find enriching ideas of Tanya, Dr. Rebbe says, in, in my world, in God's world, you can be completely honest. <laughs> There's not a part of you that you cannot bring to the table. There's not a part of you that you have to amputate. I'm not afraid of any emotion. I'm not afraid of any sensation. I'm not afraid. I'm not going to cut you off. The Benini is not a person who ignores or represses or feels despondent because he or she has not reached that place of inner wholeness, free of every trauma and every blockage in the world. No. Wherever you are in the world, wherever you are in life, you could become a living, a living, breathing being that manifests truth in this world. You could become a true Ayyad Hashem. Rav Zevin quotes the Pasuk in Shmois. What a brilliant uh, uh, phrase to use. Moshe says, let me step away from here to come closer to understand the secret of the burning bush where God's presence is. And Hashem says, no, 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 no. Take your shoes off. The place upon which you stand is sacred soil. You have to discover how the place where you are standing is Admas Kaidish. You don't need to move to another zip code. You don't need to transport yourself and become another person and get a new neshama and wait until you're old or till you go through these experiences and then you'll find holiness. No. Where you are with your gifts and challenges, with your past and present, with your insecurities and difficulties, Admas Kaidishu, you can. 
discover right now a very deep and authentic relationship with your truest self and, and, and with God. You, you, you're mentioning the email, somebody... Uh, yeah, you know, I want to hear what you have to say yeah. about that. He tells me that for my trauma healing, I had to go... I had to go. So, uh, first of all, I'm not going to pretend to be very knowledgeable about trauma. It's not my, my field of expertise. But I'll, I'll tell you from my very basic rudimentary understanding. Trauma is not about what happened to you. Because we know different things happen to different, different people and affect them differently, which is always why it's so silly for somebody to say, that's your trauma? That happened right. to my brother-in-law, and now he's right, fine. Right, 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 right. Trauma is more about the way that I understand it. There's the, <laughs> the instinct for self-preservation has exceeded its functionality. Mm. God gave me my a survival impulse. And it's, I need it. It's vital to stay in this world. And it has a job. And because of whatever reason, whatever reason, it doesn't matter how it happened. You know, in talk therapy, they'll ask me how it happened. But in trauma therapy, it's like, I don't know how the fire alarm got set off, but the fire alarm is set off and it's telling you, you're under threat, you're gonna die, Fight or flight, you need to survive, okay? So if I understand it like that, that trauma means that my God-given, beautiful, essential fight or flight survival impulse has been overactivated to the point where it is not letting me live, <laughs> I don't know of a better explanation in modern English for what a Nefesh Abamas is. So you say you see trauma in every chapter of Tanya. I would agree. The entire premise is you're not evil, you're not immoral, you have an amoral guardian protector of self-preservation, which for whatever reason, it doesn't matter the reason, has been overactivated and now it's exceeded its functionality. And we need to reel it back in and make it functional again. We're not going to eradicate it. We need to preserve it. And we need, like you were saying before about Klippa, we need to reveal its God-given functionality. We need to preserve it. And we need to get it back down <laughs> to a functional size. We need to have it working for you instead of against you. So I just think it's it's a matter of translation. That if this person who's writing this email didn't find this in Tanya, so I'm not blaming him, but I'm saying in the Hagdama it says to find somebody who explains. If you don't see the good, sweet, healing light that is in these pages, ask a teacher. Now. He probably did ask teachers for, for in his defense, whoever wrote this email, yeah, yeah, I bet yeah. you he asked several teachers and I bet he was disappointed time after time, after time, after time. And you get to a certain point where that itself becomes traumatizing and, right. and the disillusionment and the disappointment right. of constantly being told the same old song and not being heard when you just bared your soul, it becomes too much. So right. I, I'm not casting blame at all but what i'm saying is and sometimes and sometimes even with a good teacher if i'm dealing with serious trauma i may need help from professionals to help me release it through my release it from my body because i just may be so stuck that i may need that help you know? yeah sure i'm just saying academia <laughs> can't always uh... that, that it, at least he should have been able to say look i still needed help to heal from an expert but it, it was consistent with what my Mishpiyam taught me. That would have been the ideal. He would have said, I needed help from healers, but everything that I did in my healing was consistent with what I had already learned in time. Unfortunately, he's not saying that. He's saying, it was totally news to me. This, this was nothing like what Tanya was the way it was taught to me. And what I'm saying is that I guess I wish there were more teachers of Tanya 
who could speak in these terms and say, Nevesh Abamis means you just want to survive. You're not bad. You're just doing what you think you need to do to survive. So going back to our other discussion about thinking that eating will do it, thinking that the pleasure of, of, of intimacy will do it. All of these things are, I think this is what I need right now. Now, you're going to convince me it's not what I need? <laughs> Who are you talking to? Who are you talking to? I, I don't speak that language. You're not going to philosophize me out of this position. Okay. But the first thing we need to do is recognize where these impulses are coming from. In other words, I just want to clarify one more thing, and I want to hear what you have to say about this. The mistakes that we're making are not deus reus. They're not bad ideologies where we're, we, we have we've decided to enshrine, to make a shita out of our, I mean, maybe after a while, the rationalization kicks in, and that's something else, something else that Nefesh Bamas does after the fact. But at its core, at its core, I'm just trying to survive. And so any system that's going to be successful for me has to first and foremost validate and acknowledge that. And I think that's what happens in the beginning of pedagogy. He says, hey, hold on a second. This, this is in the blood, man. Like before we even get to the midas that come from it, this is posh it biological. This is in your blood. So we're not talking about morality yet. We haven't even gotten into a moral discussion. How could there be moral judgment? We're talking about blood. You're going to, mor- you're going to cast moral judgment on some blood? We're talking about physicality. This is the body. There's no wrong or right at this point. And and, and I I think that if you have that discussion first, it becomes a completely different Tanya. It's a different book. The most important thing is to be able to have compassion for your animal soul. I, I would agree the compassion also, by the way, chapter which is Midas Harachamim, chapter 40, chapter 40, uh, 40, uh, 45, 45 says to have compassion on your godly soul, but that's, that's much later. We have to also have compassion on him, but, but what does it mean? Compassion? Because people are going to give you pushback again. Like I told you, you test Kissel. They're going to say, Jacob said enough with the lovey dovey. We don't need it. Okay. Use, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ban the word compassion. Use another, tell it to me in another way. How, what does is, what is Tanya want? Don't tell me what you say. Tell me, what does Tanya say? According to your understanding, what does Tanya say? Not what I should do about this, because we haven't even gotten to instructions yet. Just self-knowledge. How should I regard my animal soul? All I'm asking. And don't use the word compassion. No, I'm asking you. I think what Alter Rebbe is telling us is that for most of us, this is a very real and authentic part of our experience. And we have to recognize it as such and realize that our journey of life includes that ongoing dialogue and relationship between our souls. What's it doing? What does it want? I, I started off by saying a nefesh is a drive. What does it want from me? It's so insistent. What does it want? So in chapter one, he speaks about kas, a- anger, arrogance, gaiva, right? The element of fire, right? Then he speaks about cravings. I just want to have a good time. Taibas of Nugim. Whatever it is, sexuality, <laughs> all types of, of, of leisure and fun and, and what we call chilling out and enjoying life, right? You say Hamayim. Then there's Litsanis, uh, right? Inspirers, Dvarim Betelem. <laughs> Mockery, cynicism, uh, boasting, putting down people. Okay, that's Ruach. And then there is laziness and depression, despondency, Misei Dafa. Right, that's right. The beginning of Tanya. <laughs> it's 
Is this a healthy animal soul or is this a traumatized animal soul? That's a very good question. Gaiva, I need you to speak about me. I need a lot of validation. I finish a speech. I need a standing ovation. Don't give me a shikayach. I'm angry. I'm angry. I am angry. I am burning up from anger. You told me no. My wife said something. My husband said something. My teenage boy or girl said something to me. And I am furious. I want to tell you, get out of my life. Get out of my house. I am just desiring cravings, whatever those are. Or I'm just lazy. I'm just lazy. I'm just not in the mood of anything. And I'm, and I'm depressed. So, so, so talk, 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 through, talk. Could you talk to my animal soul, Rabbi uh, Taub? <laughs> <laughs> Am I healthy? Am I traumatized? <laughs> so here's what I would say to you. I would say, I have a vision for you of health where your animal soul remains not only every bit intact, but that which makes it, that which makes it special meaning the hallmarks of the animal soul, meaning its passion, its, intens its intensity, all of those things will be preserved. But they'll all be properly channeled. It's an energy. It's an energy. And it needs to be redirected. So I would say like this, the fact that your animal soul presently thinks it needs a standing ovation and feels existentially threatened when it does out of how dare you how dare you right that requires healing or let's call it realignment i don't want to take that animal salt and tell it hey stop wanting how do you tell wanting to stop wanting how can you tell desire not to desire that the is whole, my MO. I desire. A, a nefesh is a drive. Yeah, chapter Don't chapter nine. Chapter nine, he says, the oinig of the nefesh alikis can transform the oinig of the nefesh of Bahamas. You need to identify the pleasure of the animal soul. It's looking for pleasure or survival. I mean, it's, it's, so you're it's, saying the anger is an animal soul that's out of whack. My, my amygdala is threatened. I'm saying... I don't have vision. I'm, I'm, I'm stuck. To use the language of the Dalit Yesodes there in the end of Patek Aleph, not that this is... By the way, I want you to know something, Rabbi Jacobson. Amygdala and prefrontal cortex and all that stuff, in the 1700s, that was you say the ace, you say the ruach. In other right. words, I these these terms they they change with the time. These yeah. are these are these are scientific terms. So that was what the, the yeah, TV yeah. and it's so important when he's busy. The Rebbe is busy with the left ventricle that's filled with blood. The Rebbe has a discussion about the right ventricle, right? The left ventricle, because the right ventricle, the blood still has to be oxygenated, it has to be sent to the lungs. In the left ventricle, it's now fertile. It's ready to, to, to vivify the body, to send the oxygen and the nutrients. So Dr. Rebbe keeps on talking about the left ventricle. And, and perhaps part of what he's saying is, as you said before, this is your embodiment. I mean, the animal soul is embodied in, in, in your blood and it's going to go through all your body. So your bodily sensations and palpitations and experiences, you know, that stress and anxiety that you're feeling in your body, that's... That's your animal soul talking, right? Look, we're, we're, we're learning right now in Rambam, and, I, and I make, I'll admit that I made a big mistake not learning Rambam before I got on a Zoom with you. But <laughs> at least from yesterday or a couple of days ago, it told me that a quarter of a leg of human blood is akin to an entire dead person because that is the amount of blood that it takes to maintain the life of a person. 
So what, what do I get from this? <laughs> what am I supposed to take from this? And take a little bit of Rambam from the other day to Perak Aleph of Tanya. Again, like I was saying before, I cannot cast moral judgment on a revius dom. I can't, <laughs> and you're calling it being compassionate. I don't want to use the word compassionate yet. I think compassionate is a good word, but I think I'm, I'm pushing back because I think a lot of people hear it. They're like, lovey dovey. You know, it's just, it's too easy to dismiss. So I would like to use different terms and say, let's withhold judgment. How are you going to be, how are you going to condemn a, a puddle of blood? You take this puddle of blood, its job, it has a job. Its job is to keep you alive. Now, God gave it its job. And God gave it that job to keep you alive. Now, it happens to be, if you want to use the Neoplatonic terminology, the, if you want to use the scientific language from 200 years ago, you could say, because of Hagbaris, Midas, the Yesoid Ha'esh, so there's, there's, it comes, it's manifest as anger and as arrogance. And if the Yahagbar of the of the Yusayid the Hamayim it would come out as lust and, and et cetera, et cetera. Okay. But the point is what we're talking about is an imbalance. Imbalance. An imbalance in, in the humors, okay, in the in the elements. So so what we're saying is a drive is a drive. Don't tell a drive not to be driven. That's what a drive does. That's what it does. Don't tell the animal soul. We're going to turn you off because that means you're, you're threatening, you're telling me we're going to die. And my whole job is not to let us die, even if I have to kill myself to prevent us from dying. You want to think about that irony. Even if I have to kill myself to prevent us from dying. That doesn't make sense according to your word brain, but from the perspective of an animal soul, it makes a heck of a lot of sense. Okay? I have to preserve me even if I have to do things that I know are killing me. So first and foremost, what I need to do is be realistic. There's a drive. It has a God-given purpose to keep me alive. Right now, it's out of whack, to use your technical terminology, meaning there's too much of this element or that element, and it's expressing itself as this or, or, or as that. But what I want to do is I want to get it rebalanced and I want to get it realigned and I want to get it back into harmony with its counterpart, which it thinks is threatening its existence. And I need to make peace between them and tell them, sweetheart, that, 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 that crazy guy over there, who's like basking in the rays of godliness and he, he's not trying to kill you. He's trying to allow you to truly live. Now, if your attempt to wrest satisfaction out of this world have already come to a point of un unmanageability, it's a soft sell that I, can sell that I can sell that to you much more easily. I can say to you, you know that your survival impulse has been anything but you know that your self-survival has actually led to your own, to, to, to threatening and your, your, own, your own life. My question is, and I think this is the main question, I can take Tanya to a room full of addicts. How do you take Tanya to 15-year-old kids who have a normal life, if there's any such thing as, as normal in this absolutely insane gullus that we live in. How do you explain Tanya to people who don't see that the animal soul has become a threat to them? They still think it's doing a fine job working for them. And I almost feel like accelerating to chapter 29 and recontextualizing the whole chapter 29 about how to have a real intervention with the animal soul in 2021. Because to, it, to chapter 29, what, what, what everybody invokes as mevachin, I say, beat the hell out of them. No, it's called an intervention. We're going to cause you to face some facts. We have a list. We're moted de okay? We've been 
compiling some documents here. We want you to face the reality of the ramifications of the way you've been living. And we're not here to rub it in. We're here to get you to admit the way that you've been living. Your best thinking, your best decisions have led you to a place that you are unhappy with. So I think we really, when I, I keep circling back to the same idea, but if we, you can't sell this program for living to somebody who still thinks everything is working fine. It can't be done. Now, the people were coming to the Alter Rebbe and Yechidus. They were already, they were already, receptive because they were frustrated enough they were coming they were saying there's something terribly wrong and i don't even know what it is so they were ready to listen but the 15 year old sitting in the tanya class he didn't come up to anyone and say there's something terribly wrong all my best efforts have gotten me to a point of pitiful uh, incomprehensible demoralization he's not saying that so how do we teach tanya to him that's what i'm saying Right. Reb Chase, forgive me for, for bringing this up again. I just want to understand. Atzlus. If I'm feeling lazy, I'm 15 years old, I'm 19 years old, I'm 40 years old, I'm 50 years old. I'm feeling lazy. I'm just lazy. Is that really trauma? <laughs> well, what does that mean? Is that trauma? Is that coming from trauma? Is that from the Tanya's description, really, that my animal soul is, is not in tune with itself? So again, trauma doesn't mean what happened to you. Trauma means that you are trying to survive in a way that doesn't serve you well. And laziness is a form of that survival. An attempt to survive. I'm going to be lazy, maybe, because I'm afraid of failure, Right. It, it, it's it's much simpler than that. Yes, it's called. I can't open up the mail because maybe there'll be a bill inside. So my limbic brain tells me that that piece of mail is a snake. But so I'm hoping there's a check inside. I hope there's a check inside. Okay, so already you convinced yourself there's a check. Trach, I, trach good. <laughs> <laughs> so that the Mashpia told you, no, there's not a bill. There's a check. Okay, but I see that envelope. But you're saying laziness is really an animal soul that's afraid of reality. Yeah, and therefore I'm using procrastination as a survival skill, as an attempt at a survival skill. Of course, of course. So that, that so that is so important. So so what Al Tareb is, is simply is really helping us and trying to give us the ultimate self awareness in terms of every thought and every emotion and every sensation that we're experiencing. And he's he's notifying me about all the survival skills that I've accumulated over my life, which are adaptations which are not serving me well. He's not judging me. Remember again, no, I'm not casting no judgment. moral judgment on a Ravias Dom. No, no. I'm telling you. Dibur shal chiba. Dibur shal chiba. His words, dibur shal chiba. That doesn't sound like judgment. It's called love. I love you. And therefore I'm sharing this. Finish. He's not judging, right? He, 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 he's informing me of a truth. He's empowering. Empower, and therefore empowering. Well, and therefore, yes. Con consequently, it comes to empowerment. Yeah. This is even before the empowerment. See, there are two stages. There's right. the aha. Just that is worth the price of admission. Just that I found out that I'm not evil. I'm just trying to survive. I'm just mistaken about what will do that for me. And then is the empowerment, which is, and now you can choose better. But that's step two. What will really help me survive? What will really, really help me survive in the fullest sense of not just surviving, but having a truly meaningful life? Yeah. What? What? <laughs> oh, for that, I need to come to my nefesh alakis. Right. And Reb Hillel, of... that's the story you said. You this Reb Hillel. There's a song that I heard, and I'm searching everywhere for the that's song. That's right. That's right. That's right. And I think it's in this pleasure and in that pleasure and this distraction. 
So this husband that you're describing who's looking for intimacy and he's going to his wife as the drug dealer. Right. Deep, deep down, he's looking for his song. Which, let's not speak in metaphors. Deep, deep down, he's looking for the real serenity that can only come from being truly aligned with his deepest self. And right now, he's being pulled into the clipper the externality, the superficiality, and thinking that that's where that serenity will come from. That's where that that sense of relief will come from. And he's torturing himself. And we're here to set him free. So this boy who runs away from the religious system where he was educated, and he goes to get a tattoo. He goes to Mexico and he tattoos himself. Right? This boy. Give me the, the, the external perspective and give me the real perspective. Well, maybe even, you know, he, human beings are social animals. Maybe he did that to brand himself, to belong. He wants to align himself with a certain identity. He's looking for a relationship. Well, he's looking for a context for who am I? He said, or maybe he has to disassociate himself from that community. That or maybe so first, pain. yeah. So he goes to the first, other extreme. Yeah, and that's, all, and that's all survival. That's all survival. Of course it's survival. Of course it's survival. That's right. Because animal soul is actually doing the best thing it can under the circumstances. His animal soul is doing what it thinks it needs to do. And no amount of reasoning is going to talk him out of it. Right. Because the animal soul doesn't and listen the, to reason. And that is why the Alter Rebbe keeps on teaching us about our animal souls so that we should be able to appreciate the pnimius, the truth of what's happening, so that the klipa shouldn't eclipse our vision. And we shouldn't get duped and deceived by an animal soul that's really craving for sublimation. So, so let me understand this clearly. The two modalities in Tanya of Eskafia and Eshapcha really emerge as two extraordinary rich modalities in life. Eskafia means I can't now transform my animal. I can't. I'm, I'm still stuck. I have these sensations. I have these crazy emotions. I have this terrible anger or, or need for validation or, or, or despondency. But... I could be aware of my value system. I could be aware of who I really aspire to be and even who my animal soul really aspires to be. And therefore, I can make choices that are reflective of my expansive, infinite, divine consciousness, which will truly fill me and lead me on the road towards personal and collective redemptiveness. That's Eskafia. Eskafia is when I actually yeah. can caress my animal and help it mature and open up and release and release the tension and release the need to, to cover things up and release that addictive personality. And it says, I'm, I'm just, we're, we're in this together. I'm, uh, I love you, my divine soul. And, and so Eskafi and Eshapcha are, are essential to the process. And to wait for Eshapcha, you're shooting yourself in the back because you don't have to wait. There's always room for, for, for good choices, even in the midst of, of, of insanity. But as we we're saying, it's a two-step process. First, acknowledge what we're dealing with, then make better choices. So first acknowledge, there's this Revia's Dom has one job to live. It's pumping through my veins and it's telling me right now, I need the applause to live. I need uh, cheesecake to live. I need intimacy to live. Okay. I need to not look, not open up my bills for three months to live. Okay. <laughs> I need to procrastinate. I can't answer the telephone. Right. Okay. Now, the episode, I think there's a book that has a title. If you go into the refrigerator to binge, pull up a chair. <laughs> Just observe it. 
<laughs> you're eating anyway. You're eating anyway. But just look at what you're doing. Uh-huh. Take I, some I notes. That, huh? Huh? Take, Take some notes notes. while you're there. Alter Rebbe says, okay, you're fressing away like a Zoyal Vasaiva. Can you just take note the shell that you're living in? And you're just going from Klipas Neuga, which is a redemptive shell, an open shell, to, uh, to a dense shell. That's a very... Uh, for the Alter Rebbe not to teach this to us would be cruel. It would be, it would be isolating us from vital information. Right? It would be forcing me into a hole for the rest of my life without any, without any hope. You speak about teaching Tanya to 15, 16, 17, 18 year olds whose animal souls are working. But maybe that's exactly the point. Imagine if in every classroom, in every school, we can have an open conversation about things in life that are difficult for us. Expressing myself, uh, internal self-esteem. Uh, well, I'll tell you why I'm actually against that, but I'm for it. <laughs> I, I got a call from a school, and they said um, the girls started talking about stuff that we don't want them, them to talk about. I think they were 12, 13, that age, and there were some girls in the class who were more precocious. And they introduce certain subjects. And so could you come in and have like a, a session with them about that topic? So I said, I don't understand. You want me to come in and tell them to stop talking about the thing that I'm going to come in, especially just to talk about. <laughs> so they, they said, well, when you put it that way, it sounds silly. <laughs> I said, that's my job. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> To talk people out of hiring me. That's my job. So, I, no, but, I, but I mean, I mean, if we can allow but, our children and teens to have an open conversation but, but listen about to what I told Bahamas. Them. Okay, but listen to what I told them. I said, you're a Labavitcher school. Ostensibly, all of these conversations, you're smiling because you know where I'm going. All of these conversations could have and should have taken place already in the context of really learning Siddhis. So I'm not going to be an accessory to the crime of reinforcing even further. Here's this totally inapplicable study called Chassidus. And here's the session where we get real. No, those discussions, if you're learning Tanya right, are going to come up organically in the context of learning Tanya. And if they're not coming up in You're not the learning course, Tanya. You're not learning Tanya. You're learning uh, the wrong, you're, you're, you're calling it Tanya. You're reading, the, you're reading the words. If Tanya is not addressing those daily experiences, struggles, dilemmas of every teenager and every adult, we're simply not learning the book. You're not learning the book. That's right. And that's why he says in the Hagdama, you, you can't teachers. just open the book and read from it. You need somebody who's going to get into the guts of it with you. But then they say, and there's a lot of questions, somebody just wrote, come on, the model of Tanya is the Benini, who never sinned, chapter 12, never sinned, never will sin. You just took this book and made it a book for three people in a generation. I think this is, this is for teenagers. This is for young adults. This is for a 25-year-old young man or woman who's... Uh, whose bodies are alive and vibrant <laughs> and, 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 yeah. and fully youthful. Somebody once told me, this is for a 95-year-old, you know, depressed soul, a guy who's ready to die already. Fine. <laughs> Put it and on I'm your bucket like, list. Huh? Last, the bucket list, the last thing before you die, become a Bainini. You'll become a Bainini. Why not? They'll have a good legacy. They'll give you a headline. You know, he died a Bainini of Tanya. You know what the Kutzker Rebbe once said, right? Kutzker Rebbe once said the Yitzhahara is there even in the, your last breath. They said, what? He said, the Yitzhahara says, Yankel, don't just die. Say a nice Shema Yisrael before you die. <laughs> the Kutzker Rebbe. This <laughs> you can't forget. And, you know, the slightest, uh, the slightest. Uh... But, that, but that's a good question. That's a good question. 
one of the, the most the, I mean right away what what the, one of the most annoying questions yes like personally why do I find it annoying because it's a conversation killer so one of the most I, I I like I like I like things that keep a conversation going, not that um, shut down. Maybe dialogue. we could surprise ourselves, Rabbi Taub. So by what? Using the conversation killer and it not kill the conversation? Yeah. Okay, so here's the conversation killer, okay? And you tell me if you, you get triggered the same way that I do. Definitely, my nephew Obamas feels that its survival is threatened. When, when I'm teaching Tanya and someone says, but how many Bainim are there really? Okay, forget it. So let's not learn it. Do you have the same reaction that I do to that? I personally don't because I asked this question very early on and I got some really good answers. So so I actually, I look forward to be able to respond to the person. Ah, okay. So I'm going to do it to you. Hold (laughs) on. Rabbit, hold on. How many Bainanim are there really? Right. So, so I once asked this question from Rabbi Yoel, and he, he really gave such a beautiful answer. And it's, I don't think it's a, you know, people say it's a cliche. I don't think it's a cliche. He said, the Alter Rebbe is describing a truth that exists in every person's life. And he said, you are a Bainani. Maybe not concerning 613 mitzvahs, but there is a particular mitzvah and sin relative to which you are a bainani, which means you experience it, you experience the craving, you experience the struggle, you know exactly what it feels like. It's not like your heart is cleansed from any awareness that this is even something you know that can be a temptation. It's not like by a tzaddik where a sin is like eating glass, you know, or eating excrement. It's not eating excrement. It's, it's appealing. And yet your awareness of what's true and what's not true, what's meaningful, what's not meaningful, who you really are, you know, is so powerful that it doesn't get into the next level where it starts ruling and executing itself in your life. So, so the Alter Rebbe is teaching us a model of existence where despite tension and despite wounds and despite laziness and despite various issues that every single one of us deals with constantly and without denying anything and without repressing and without suppressing and without amputating and without beating myself up for having these experiences because the Alter Rebbe says you don't have to beat yourself up so badly because this is part of, of your journey. You could still every moment live life to the fullest. I was at a Shabbaton in Toronto and Rabbi Zaltzman is the shliach there for the Russian community, Rabbi Yossel Zaltzman. I think it was him. He told me that Reb Nissen Reb Nissen Nemenov stayed in his home when he was a child. Reb Nissen Nemenov, the mashpi of Brinoa, had the reputation of being a Benini of Tanya. There were a few Jews, Reb Chaim Moshe Alperovitz, Reb Moshe Axelrod, in the last generation. They were like the Benini, Reb Itcham Asmed. So Zaltzman, Rabbi Zaltzman tells me, he went over to Reb Nissen, he was like, I think, maybe eight or nine, he came out of Russia, I think, and he asked Reb Nissen, is it true that you're a Benini of Tanya? <laughs> is it true? And Reb Nissen said, everybody could be a Benini. He said, come on. And Reb Nissen told him something very wise. Reb Nissen said, okay. For the next one minute, can you be a Benini of Tanya? For the next minute. He said, yeah. So what about for two minutes? He said, yeah. He says, a bainani is a bainani one minute at a time. There is something very special about that. What do they say in recovery? One day at a time, right? Reb Nissen said one minute at a time. In other words, when we look at the bainani in absolute terms, we're undermining the tanya. The whole point of the tanya is, I'm not speaking to absolute people in absolute terms. I'm talking to people who live in a world of vicissitudes and whose life is in flux. The Benini is a model. 
the next minute, can I be a Bainini? What does that look like? It looks like that I may be in a bad mood and I may be experiencing the emergence of trauma and a host other things that I'm experiencing. And yet my self-awareness can be intact only, only if I have moments of the day of meditation and davening and learning where I am inspired. So I have real self-awareness of my divine soul. And then even six hours later, when I get triggered and my animal soul is going crazy, I could still make decisions that will lead the world and myself to redemption rather than to tyranny and subjugation. And that's a minute by minute decision. And sometimes I can be a Bainini today and tomorrow I lose it. But it doesn't take away from the fact that I was that I was a Bainini today. He does not. Well, the Rebbe says he never sinned and he never will sin, but we know what the Rebbe explains, right? That right now your conviction is such that if you replicate this moment, you're not going to sin. It doesn't mean you're never going to sin. Mm. So that's how I understand it. And, and for the Alter Rebbe to write, you could be a Bainini, but I don't really mean it. I don't really mean it. You know, Rebbe missing Nemenov and, and another few people, you know, between you and me, it doesn't work that way. He, he's trying to help people see that they are really capable of healing. <laughs> you, you are greater than you ever imagined you are to be. And not because you don't have issues. That's not the Tanya. You have issues. <laughs> you have issues. But your greatness is still awesome. And your choices are really present. And you are empowered to, to live an extraordinary life, which means a life that embodies your nefesh alikis. Your chelik eleka mimal, mamish, which means embodiment. Did I assuage your triggers, my dear friend? <laughs> or, or I only made them worse? <laughs> it's, 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 it's a good answer, and it's one of the answers that I use. But should we continue role playing? Should I be realistic about the conversation? Is not trying to cover anything up with. Okay, so it's supposed to be an honest conversation. Okay, so then, if the person knows a little bit of Tanya enough to be dangerous, so they'll say to me, um, "Well, you're moving the goalposts." And maybe even they'll say something about Aveda Sabaini and Daga Sabaini and what you're describing. Yeah, that's, you know, a certain relative definition, but um, that's not what the Altareb's goal is in the book. He's not, his goal isn't that you have a moment of self-control. His moment is you turn the corner and you enter a new phase where you have a whole you know different what? relationship with your uh, with your. You know what? Friends. We all know how true mitzvah gereres mitzvah is. A person who lives one day or one week with their full consciousness, that's where you want to go to. <laughs> we don't like trauma. We don't like living in, in, in a restricted, narrow amygdala that's out of whack. It's fun to be an angry man, an angry father. It's fun. It's fun to always need validation, I'm asking you, and live that way. It's fun to be lazy and depressed. It's fun to be mocking people and cynical. It's bitterness. It's, it's a frustrated life. The Benini is, is a free human being, and not because he or she doesn't have obstacles and, and challenges and pain and grief and, and blockages. But because despite that, that Kibara Ha'am, they know how to escape Pharaoh at every moment, chapter 31. So I think it's a real mitzvah, real mitzvah, gerere, mitzvah. You know, people think the Bainini, and a Bacha once told me, I don't want to live a miserable life. Why should I be a Bainini? <laughs> I want to live a chilled life. How sad it was to hear that. Yeah. Well, th that, that's what I was saying before. That somebody. Well, what had, are we not articulating? The Alter Rebbe, did, you want to live a chilled life. And what did the Alter Rebbe want? That you should be a crushed person? That, that, that goes back to what I was saying before that if a person still hasn't experienced the pain of right. trying to pursue right. 
self gratification. So it's still working for them. Right. So all they could imagine is if it's not that, it must be pretty frustrating, boring, plain. Uh, right. Right. So th- th- they're not. Th- that's that's more of an innocent question. The guy who says that doesn't trigger me because <laughs> never it, it wasn't sold to him properly. He he he's imagining the Bainley is as as I don't, I, I guess he's imagining he has no life. He's not excited about anything. He has no passions. He has no personality. He has no personality, completely suppressed, right? He doesn't understand. No one explained to him that the, the, the real Bainley is actually the opposite of suppression. He's somebody who's able to fully be himself. Fully. But, and, 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 but, but so that, that doesn't bother me. But go, and, and me. I, would, I would argue, and yeah. I don't know this for sure, but it seems to me, when people came to the Alter Rebbe, they were coming from the opposite direction. They were learning the books of Musar, the Reishas Chachma, and the Shari Tshuva, and Arches Tzadikim, and Chayvah Salavavas, Beinu Yoyne, and Shalom, and Kisvei Arizal, and Reikeach, and Sefer Chesidim. And we're talking about real people. We're talking about great minds who came to the Alter Rebbe in the, seven, in the 18th century. And probably they were lamenting, right, that they're fake, they're hypocritical, they're inauthentic. They're not real Jews. They have all these hivas. And what did the Alter Rebbe tell them? I don't want to use these words of, uh, of you know, relax. I don't think he was telling them relax, but what he was telling them is, Chevra, no, <laughs> you're amazing. God loves you. Serve Hashem with joy, with alacrity, with depth, with awareness. Ulai lekach nivra, perik of Zion. Right? God doesn't need one dish. God doesn't love one dish. There's a diversity of dishes. In other words, he took them from a place of anxiety, religious anxiety, to a place of, of menuchas anefesh. That was the Tanya. And Today, by the way, they weren't uh, coming to the Alter Rebbe to complain they had too much religious anxiety. Because no, they wouldn't have complained about that. Right. <laughs> they were complaining that they're doing all the religious anxiety and it's not working. Yeah. The bottom line, it's not working. Right. It's not working. They wish it was working, but it's not. And it, therefore it's creating more anxiety. It seems like from the, the Alter Rebbe doesn't say clearly what the questions were because he created a model that should work for so many different types of questions. But from the answer, from the explanations, it seems that at least that was the nature of some of the questions. Today, what's happening is, and this is what I find painful is, people are like, Tanya? It's giving me so much anxiety. It's giving me so much tension. When the Alter Rebbe threw his Tanya was actually assuaging the anxiety. He was actually allowing people to experience, you know, the Simcha of Kirvas Alekim and, and Simchas Levav and Tiferes Hadar Gainoi. And, and, uh, and, and as he says, you know, in Lamad Gimel, sometimes you just have to open your heart and, and feel the joy. And he did it by teaching people that they don't have to cut out any part of their personality. They don't have to. They have to be in control of themselves. They can't let the Eight Sahara take over. So, so it's sad when the Tanya is being seen as serving the antithetical purpose to what it served for, for hundreds or thousands and thousands of Jews when, when it was written. Correct me if I'm wrong. I see a lot of people are asking this. Yeah. Yetzirah Nefesh Bahamas. it seems to me, and I think in Torah or in Miketz or other places, it's almost clear that... The Nefesh of Bahamas is, at its core is that innocent animal. And the Eight Sahara is the way its cravings are actually manifested at this moment, which can sometimes be an inclination towards negativity or even immorality. Right? And that's why he doesn't use so much the word Yet Sahara in Tanya. He does, but it's not the frequent term. He goes into Nefesh of Bahamas because his model is essentially a more elevated and inclusive model because an animal you don't have to destroy, an animal you have to educate.
Well, he, he says that, you know, the Shedin Nuchrayin, Shedin Yudayin, right? That essentially Nefshabamis just wants to survive. It's amoral, not immoral. Now, if that dysfunction gets even further out of whack, then it could, you know, de- develop a perversity. But that's essentially not what it is. And in, fa- in fact, he even defines it as foreign when it happens. That's what, what does it mean? It's a foreign negativity. That's the literal translation of that Aramaic term. It's a foreign negativity. What I also find fascinating is that in chapter six, he uses the word from Kehelas, Uru'us Ruach, as a broken spirit, right? Kol hadvarim shenasim tachas Hashem shakal ruach, ruach, which is one of the etymologies of the word ra. So what we translate as evil in Tanya may actually, should have should perhaps be translated as broken, disassociated, fragmented, disconnected. In Babakama, we have Kaisal Ra'ua, Perikakainis, a flimsy, uh, rickety, shaky, broken wall. Rashi says it's going to fall down. It's going to be dismantled. It has to be dismantled tomorrow because it's going to fall down. Ovid Lemister. So is there Tanya really teaching us that the Ra is essentially the experience of isolation, of disassociation? I'm broken. Why am I broken? Because Yachatz, I don't experience myself as one with the infinite oneness. Lemeve echad b'echad. I don't. I experience myself as separate, as detached. And very often my animal soul, therefore, intensifies that isolation by detaching me even more in order to survive. And I dig myself deeper into this world of Ra, which really is not evil as much as it's brokenness, which can then lead me to behaviors that can become immoral and sometimes evil, what we call evil. You, you agree with this? Yeah, 100%. That's, that's all it is. So I'll tell you one of my triggers. When I was started to teach Tanya and I was reading all the translations of Tanya, every time I saw Russia wicked, I'm like, there's something off here. Yeah. Sadik righteous, Bain in the intermediary, no. Ra evil, no, sorry, I don't think so. I don't think the Russia of Tanya is wicked. And the tzaddik is not righteous. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, the tzaddik and, tzaddik and the bain, I mean, intermediary, and I don't think ra is evil. I think we need much more subtle and sophisticated translations. You know, Russia is, I think, more the person who falls prey to their weakness to their shells, to their blockages. And obviously there's so many different levels. And the Benini is, is the possible man, the possible human being. And the Tzaddik, I don't want to say he's a superman, because I don't think that's the appropriate translation, but the Tzaddik is really that person who, who reaches that space of, of a fusion, of oneness. In, 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 you know, you want to define these terms. So, you know, we have Perig Yod, Yod Aleph, Yod Base. So, what, 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 what's a tzaddik? Perig yud. So what's a tzaddik? Okay, a tzaddik with tevle, a tzaddik with raloi. But right. basically, the word I would use is an integrated person. You might call it integrity. We use integrity to mean honest, but integrity really means integrated, one straight line. That my koiches and my levoshim and the koiches of both nefashes, and it's all aligned. There's, there's no fragmentation. There's no, I'm, not, I'm not estranged from myself. So I'm fully integrated. And then, who, who, who's the Rasha? Aleph. It's somebody who even once believes the drive for self-preservation when it tells me that anything other than oneness will make me happy. And who's the Bainani Yod base? Somebody who's no longer going to buy into that lie. He has not achieved the integration of the tzaddik, but he knows the lie.
People are asking a very important question. Somebody says, all of your conversations seem to contradict what the Alter Rebbe says in chapter 28. Somebody wrote that now? Because I got that question after you tested. Yeah, in the comments, in the comments here on the yeshiva.net, the Alter Rebbe in 28 says, don't be a fool that you're going to sublimate your midos. And when you have a machshav azar in the middle of davening, you're going to take it back to its source and you're going to dig and penetrate and find a spark. And you know what's going to happen? It's going to schlep right. you right down. You're not a tzaddik. Realize that you're at best, at best aspiring oh. to be something okay. close to the world of a benini. And he says, and you guys are talking about... Uh, no, he's looking for the music, Reb Hillel of Parich. <laughs> uh, he's but looking I got for a this song. Exact huh? criticism after the Yutes Kislev Fabrangim, yeah. where we spoke similar things. Somebody said to me, "Isn't your whole tzugang wasn't that in direct negation of the the clear uh, and and explicit uh, words of the Alter Rebbe and and Perek Chofches?" And for those who don't. I think we need to fill in background because not everybody may be familiar with this. Okay. So Perechov Chas is speaking about challenges that one may encounter at times of tefillah. And it says that when he feels that he's being beset by a, a particular type of distraction. Okay. So he may want to, this is what the, the Alter Rebbe sort of warns against. He says he may want to try to grapple with it. He may want to try to tap into the, the, the holy emotion at the core of the unholy emotion and, and, and try to strip away the negative form that it's taking on and get down to the, the purity, the pristine, uh, the holy emotion that it's at, that it's, that's at its core. But he shouldn't do this. He says, actually, don't be a fool. Don't be a fool. You would be a fool to attempt this because this, in this method, is called halos hamidois, which, as you said, is called sublimation. I guess it'd be the best English translation would be sublimation of, of the emotions. He says, don't be a fool to attempt that. And he explains why. He says, because this method is a legitimate method, but for whom? And he qualifies it. He says, for tzaddikim. Because the tzaddik, if the tzaddik is being disrupted with these types of distractions, they're not coming from within. The tzaddik is picking up on his radar stuff that's coming from other people. And therefore, he can, if, if the tzaddik's being disturbed by your machshav azara, he can sort of tap into it and he say, okay, hold on. All right, right now you're experiencing a machshav azara about an attraction that you have to something that is prohibited. But in the essence of it, it's really, it's a misguided love for Hashem. So I'm going to drill down deep into the core of it and pull out the love and then get rid of the, the, the external form that it was taking on and we redeem the whole situation. Yes, a tzaddik can do that because he does it for other people. It wasn't coming from him. The Alter Rebbe says, but if you're experiencing your own machshav azara, if you're generating it, it's coming from within, right? The call is coming from inside the house. Then don't be a fool because you're not going to successfully sublimate that emotion. You're only going to be dragged down. He says, how could you lift it up when you're tied down below? Don't do that. So somebody asked, it sounds like things that you were saying, you test kiss live about he's only looking for his song, right? Hill Potter's Marshall, you're only looking for your song. You're really, it's a misguided attempt for wholeness, and you're looking for love in all the wrong places and all the things we spoke about, you test kiss live. And that really all you want is God. Hey, that sounds strikingly familiar to something the Alter Rebbe told me specifically not to do. And you guys, are saying that you should do it, so that was that was the criticism. I'll let I'll let you respond to the criticism. Right. So the answer to <laughs> so I I'll tell you something I heard directly from Rabbi Yael Khan 
Zechrona Levracha, in whose memory this program was initiated and continues. And God willing, we'll continue over the next months. We're going to try to do once a month, Bli Neder. And I once heard from the Biel as follows. He asked a question. He said, in Igeris HaKadosh Semen Chafhei, the Alter Rebbe actually uses this model of Halah Samidois in a very practical way. And he tells a Jew how to actually implement it in his life. He says, what happened to Ali Yishaita in chapter 27? Can you give us a little, I just want to stop you. Uh, Simon Chofhei is talking about uh, answering the criticisms against Sivas and Rivash, but could, could you just fill in a little bit? Yeah. The Alter Rebbe there discusses there was tremendous criticism on the teaching of the Baal Shem Tev, how the Shekhinah could sometimes be embedded and concealed in the voice of somebody who is disturbing you from davening. And the opposers to Hasidus, they burnt the Tzavos or Rivosh, they burnt it. Because they, he said, this is heresy. And the Alter Rebbe dedicates a whole letter. He wrote a long letter. It's a very long letter in his own writing. This is his own writing, chapter 25 of Geras HaKadosh, where he explains what the Baal Shem Tev meant. It's an amazing, it's an, it's an amazing piece of work. It's an amazing letter. The Alter Rebbe writes over there that the Baal Shem Tev used to speak in Yiddish, but the writers wrote it down in Hebrew. And they were not, they did not therefore write it meticulously. They wrote the word sharsa instead of nislapsha, which is a fascinating discussion. But the point that's relevant to our conversation tonight is the concept that sometimes you're looking at somebody who's completely fighting Yiddishkeit, and you have to know that the Shechina is somehow embedded and hidden there, even though the person is not consciously aware <laughs> that they are serving as a tool for the Shekhinah. But you have to be aware of it, and therefore it ought to inspire it you It doesn't more. excuse the person. We have to it make- doesn't excuse the person. Right. But it has to inspire you to get closer to God because it's really not here to destroy you. It's here to challenge you and stimulate you and bring out a deeper energy in you. And the Bioyal said, what happened to Ali Yishaita? This was his question. Maybe somebody asked In other asked words, that. there's seemingly a contradiction between... It's contradiction. Perechov Ches in Lekutei Amorim and Simen Chof Hei of Yigeres Yeah. I have to say, this was many, many years ago, so it's not verbatim and could be a mistake in part of what he said, but this is what I remember because I remember I left an impact on me. I just want to make sure said, everyone's following this because before you say how Rabbi explained it, I just want everyone to fully appreciate it. <laughs> Perek Chavches says, don't be a fool. You would be a fool to attempt to extract the real, the, the godliness at the core of this, of this yeah. distraction. And he says specifically in the context of someone who's trying to daven and who's being distracted. In the middle of davening. Okay. Yeah. And then in, in the Geras HaKadosh, oh, he man. says, there's, there's someone distracting you in the middle of davening. That's the muscle right. that he uses, that a heathen, to use the... To use the the sikh as an English word, right. a heathen, a <laughs> wicked heathen is trying. Heathen. To, you like that? A wicked heathen is distracting you in the davening. Ah, but what should you do? You should identify. This is really the shina acting through this this agent. Okay, right. So seemingly there's a there, there there's a a, a a contradiction. Right, right, right. Like in the middle of davening, you should say this is really godliness, and I'm just. It's just coming in a 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 guise, or should I should I do like you said? That would be like in in Yigeres Hakodesh Shemach Chafei, or should I do like he says in Perek Chaf Chas of Tanya of of Lukot Yamarim and ignore? He says there, ignore, 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 because you're not going to win this. So right. which is right? And here the Alter Rebbe says in Perek Chafei Yigeres Hakodesh that the Eitzah Yutsa had to really get inspired to increase your davening is by meditating on the fact that the Shechina. And its spark came down all the way to vivify this klipa, to vivify this klipa. And his words that are trying to distract you from davening are really a manifestation without him knowing it of the shechina. And therefore, it's all God asking you for a deeper relationship, which is an amazing idea, right? (laughs) It's basically God inviting me for a deeper relationship. God is like, I'm just trying to bring out who you are. <laughs> I sent this guy to disturb you so that we should be able to become aware of how real you are, how powerful you are. So all of these Klippa thoughts are just cover-ups for, for deep divinity, for deep elikos. 
And in Perik of Ches, the Alter Rebbe said, don't be a shaita. Ignore it, because you're never going to win. Yeah, you You're never going to win. And if, you, if, and if you engage it... You're going to get dragged in the mall. You're down. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I have to say, in Rabbi Adin Evan Yisrael's Tanya, he gives, he tells a story. A man went into a museum. It was a beautiful art museum. And there was a portrait there, a painting there, of a dog, a huge, mighty, ferocious dog barking. And the painting was so real that everybody, when they walked into the room, they ran away <laughs> because the dog looked so real and it seemed like you're going to be attacked. He said, and only the great artist walked in and he knew that it was simply a piece of art. And Ravadin explains that every machshav zara is a piece of divine art. But for this, you have to be an artist. <laughs> if you're not an artist, you walk in, and the dog, the dog is going to kill you. You better run away. <laughs> run away, because in this room, you're going to, you're going to, you, you'll, you know, you'll have cardiac arrest. You're going to faint. You, you're going it, it's, to, it's not for you. You're not, you're not capable of seeing the art. Very, very profound, profound illustration. So this is what Rabbi Yael explained. Rabbi Yael said, he said, don't confuse the two. Halas Hamidois is at the core of Chassidus. <laughs> And I'm now going to add, how many Maimorim and Sikhs of the Rebbe explain this point, that everything in this world has a mucker in Kedusha. I heard it myself from the Rebbe dozens of times. There's a famous Maimech Hanukkah Lamed Ches, a long Sikh in Noyach Mem Ches. The Rebbe would say it very often, everything in this world, even that which is manifested as completely antithetical to divinity, if you trace it back to its source, you're going to find a Lakos. Like the Rebbe used to say, nothing, nothing ultimately can exist without Hashem, and therefore it can be traced back to the ultimate divinity. He even once explained the Gemara, Noyach Memches. The Gemara says in Chulim, Kol ma da'asalon rachmana sharalon kavase. Whatever Hashem prohibited us, he gave us something similar that's permissible. For example, he prohibited blood, but he allowed us to eat liver. He prohibited marrying your brother's wife, but he allows yibum. He, per, he, per, he I'm sorry, he forbade you eating pork, but he allows you shibuta, which is similar to pork. Why? Why did everything that Hashem make forbidden, did he make something that's permissible, that's similar to that? You know what the Rebbe said? Moiradik. Because every isur in its shayrish is heter. It just got distorted. It got lost in translation. So, this is a yisoid in the whole chsidus, based on Kabbalah. So, the Biyayil said, What does it mean? And he said, Al Tereb is actually giving you the most realistic advice in the world. If I'm in the middle of a davening, and I'm going to use the metaphor that the Baal Shem Tev uses and his students use, and suddenly the machshava about a certain woman comes into my mind. And I'm, this is the muscle of the Baal Shem Tev. And I'm getting very, very consumed by that desire. <laughs> My body is responding. There's an intense sensation. I'm experiencing this very, very intense, intimate feeling. Now, right now, when you are experiencing this taiva in such an intense way, Rabbi Yael explained to us, if you are going to say, oh, really, it's Kedusha. <laughs> really, let me go deeper into it. He says, you are going to fall so fast. He didn't give this metaphor, but the Baal Shem Tev does. You're going to fall so fast. There's a difference between while it's raging in you, while it's burning, while it's burning, you have to know your weakness. <laughs> At this moment, you have to close your eyes. You have to run away from the museum. You just, you, you're not going to survive. Not because it's not true but because I'm in a very, very weak moment. You know, you give an addict uh, uh, wine for the four kaisas to do a mitzvah, you're destroying them. They have to use grape juice, as Dr. Tversky would always say. Not because wine is a bad thing, because you have to know your weakness. But when the taiva relaxed, when I'm more in control, he says, now, of course, you have to do halah samidais. Now, of course, you have to be zich mezboinen, that bepnimius, this is not stam negativity and evil. There's a spark. There's an invitation. That's why the whole Tanya uses the word klipa. 
Klipa means it's a shell. There's something under it. That's why the tzaddik can transform the nefesh of Bahamas because he knows that deep down the nefesh of Bahamas is not evil. The nefesh of Bahamas is looking for survival and really could be searching for godliness if it knows that the ultimate goodness and pleasure is godliness. So that's the ultimate vision and the ultimate purpose of transformation. So when he says al shaita, he uses the word shaita. He doesn't say you're wrong. You're just a fool. You know what a shaita means? Shaita means you're not reading the reality at the moment. You're admissing, if you understand that right now, you are overwhelmed by a raging, intense craving. You're not in a position for reflection, for meditation, for sublimation, for transcendence. You just, you have to acknowledge I'm in a very weak place and all I have to do is... I have to take a deep breath and I have to just go into my davening, go into my words. And Al Rebbe says, and if you can't, you have to just surrender to God at the end of the prayer. Prayer comes and he says, Hashem, just, just, just save me. Just complete surrender, complete loss of, of control because I don't have control. There's explicitly the compassion. I mean, you were talking about compassion. Right. Com- com- explicit. At the end, at the end of Chavchas. Yeah, the very end, the second eight. So he says, and if that doesn't, if ignoring, like, like you know, when you tell your mother the bullies are bothering you, she says, well, just ignore them, they'll go away. They didn't go away. <laughs> okay. So, so then- when somebody says that the Tanya is opposed to working through your emotions, I think that's a complete misunderstanding of the functionality of Tanya. Because if that was the message of Tanya, the Altarebbe should just say, you know, you have this Nefesh of Bahamas, it's evil. Just ignore it and repress it, and you go with your nefesh and kiss. The whole point of Tanya is there's a relationship. It's part of your blood. It's part of your purpose. You have to educate it. A tzaddik sublimates it completely. A benini sublimates parts of it, not completely, but also sublimates parts of it. By the way, I also heard this from the Biyayla at the end of chapter 27. He says, it's not that the Benini doesn't transform the animal soul. Of course, the Benini, you transform major parts of your animal soul. All of us do. Any one of us who tries to deal with our trauma and our wounds, trans- and we, with God's help, we're a little successful, we heal parts of our animal soul. But there's still deeper layers to the onion that we still have to uncover. So the point is not that there's no halah samidah. The point is you have to know the time and the place and the context. So I think that's a very important clarification. This is what I heard from him many years ago. I, I, I think that this, this whole discussion that we've been having, I think it's, it's important for people to realize that, <laughs> you know. Now you could say, you could say in Perik Hafei, he's not talking in the middle of davening. It's also middle of davening. But you'll realize over there, it's not a taiva of a machshav in Perik Chavches, it's a machshav azar that falls into my head. The Baal Tov gives a metaphor, a woman, right. the wife of Paitifar. The wife of Paitifar is screaming, Sheikh Vaimi, Sheikh Vaimi. In Perik Chavche, it's a guy, a heathen, who's, you know, who's, curse, who's cursing me out and doesn't want me to dive it. It's a whole different experience. He's not cursing you out. He's asking you to move your car. <laughs> right. In right. my mind, when I come to Simon Chavche, so he said, hey, can you move your car already? Can you move your car, you, <laughs> you obnoxious, fundamentalist, orthodox Jew? So the Biel was saying that that would be akin to analyzing the taiva after it relaxes, which means I finished davening. I got out of the danger zone. I'm out of the danger zone. Now can I look back and ask myself, what happened? Why do I have this crush? What am I searching for? What am I searching for? And you may find out that your Nefesh Bahamas is looking maybe for validation that you're not getting in your own home. Maybe you need that attention. Maybe you're feeling lonely. You think you need it. And you not only you think you need it, you think you need it to survive. To survive. To survive. There's an unbelievable word from the Maggot of Mizrich. It's brought in Moira Naya. You see, this is the concept of what Chassidus is teaching, and Alter Rebbe is cautioning you about this because that's the shit of Chabad, integrating it into real life. The Maggot says that when Yaakov, when Yosef saw 
how tempted he was to go to Petifer's wife, he suddenly saw the image of Yaakov, his father, in the window, and he escaped. So the Maggit says that the appeal of Petifer's wife was her beauty, Tiferis, which was the appeal of Yosef. What was Yaakov? Yaakov is Midas Hatif Eris. Yaakov is divine beauty. So Yosef said to himself, I'm looking for beauty. If I'm looking for beauty, why don't I go to the source of authentic beauty, which is Yaakov? He escaped from the narrow, filtered, restricted manifestation of beauty in Poitifer's wife to the expansive, infinite source of beauty. Now, what does this mean emotionally? What does this really mean? What this really means was, Yosef didn't need Poitifer's wife. She wasn't, she was not his soulmate. Her daughter, yes. Asnas, but not her. But Yosef was craving a certain harmony. And he got it from Yaakov. He got it from his father. He got it from God. What did you say before when you tell the addict what you're looking for, you're not going to get from the woman. You're only going to get from Hashem. But if Paitifa's wife is right here in the room and I'm not Yosef at Tzaddik, <laughs> I'm not Yosef at Tzaddik, and I start saying, I'm really looking for Tiferes. Now you're already scheming. Now you're already rationalizing how you're going to give in. Exactly. Five minutes later, I'm done. I'm chopped liver. <laughs> but if you're in a safe place, exactly, and you're in the or yeah. you're at a safe, vulnerable fabregen, yeah. everything exists, yeah. and without getting into gory details and right. distracting everybody else in the room, you can right. speak beremes and analyze what you're going through and say honestly what i'm really looking for is the wholeness is the oneness is the surrender to the all then that's then 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 you help your animals yeah you help i would i would go as far as to say you would be a fool a shoita not to do that to do that in that context. Yeah. The, does anybody think that Tanya chapter 28 is contradicting hundreds of my modem of the Alter Rebbe <laughs> and of Chassidus Chabad and of general Chassidus, because over there this theme is emphasized constantly in the works of the students of the Baal Shem Tev. They, they're, very, uh, they're very occupied with this theme that everything in Klippa has a nitzot. <laughs> That's Look, like the, the basics. Alter Rebbe is a Pisces. And the Alte right. Rebbe is touching the Moro. Yes, yeah. Now is not the time for Nitzitzis, my friend. Now is the time to go back to your Siddur and say, Hashem, just help me get through this and get into your davening more. And don't try to sublimate this woman or this crush. You're just not in the position. You have to acknowledge. And it's beautiful that he says it. You know why? Because he's showing you what's realistic and what's not realistic. In other words, let me, let me apply this in another form. When I'm overtaken by a very intense emotion, I can't always go to a place of sublimation. I can't always go to a place, really, my Nefesh Abamas wants to survive. Really, I'm not angry at you. Really, I'm not upset. Really, no, really, I'm a good guy. You're going to lose. You are upset. You are out of whack. You are overwhelmed. You are crazy. And you know what? It's okay that you're not okay. It's part of your process. But you don't have to become a slave. You don't have to start breaking windows. You don't have to explode. You don't have to implode. You could go internal and you could create space for that pain. Create space for it. Don't don't deny it. But don't indulge it. And don't rationalize with it. You're going to lose. Realize it's too painful now to deal with. Let me just do what I have to do. And you know what? Tomorrow, we're going to revisit it. And we'll work it through. Maybe you know, not but, tomorrow. Maybe in a month. What you're, what you're uh, sort of touching upon, but I want to unpack this here. <clears throat> so finally, when he does start telling me what to do, like, you know, he tells me, uh, and well, first he tells me, means uh, to be misopic, to control yourself. But I'm saying later, like, who tells me to be misbeinim. Let's clarify. I think what is a common misunderstanding is that 
people here that's okay, I should be misbeing. So what does that mean? You told me that if I'll have more Avas Hashem, then I'll be more centered, I'll be more serene, I'll uh, be more integrated. Okay, you sold me, great. So that means that next time I'm getting triggered, uh, whatever, uh, the, the, I'm caught in traffic or, uh, I don't know, somebody comes over and uh, they start yelling at me, you know, move the car, whatever. Okay. And Bashas Maise, as I'm being triggered, what should I do? Oh, be misbeining in Hashem. Oh, and it's going to take care of it. I think this, al what we were discussing a moment earlier, needs to be explained. This isn't reactive meditation. This is proactive. This is a regimen. This is a way of life that one engages in as, as this is how I live my life. This is part of my routine. Prayer and meditation is part of my, my routine. And I slowly build these muscles so that the next time I'm triggered, I'm triggered just a little bit less. But I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding of, oh, I should be misbeing as I'm being triggered. Think about God and I'll be less triggered. No, this is not. This is like saying, oh, I'm having chest pains. Is it a heart attack? Let me go start exercising. No, you call 911. You should have started exercising a year ago, but you didn't. So start exercising today to offset the heart attack that won't happen now a year from now. So I, I think this also needs to be explained as far as realistic. You talk about realistic expectations. Realistic expectations has to be grounded in what, what does this work look like? It's a, it's take five minutes a day to meditate. Take, take, <laughs> don't expect that you can do this to manage something that is, causing you to go into your uh, your animal soul uh, self-perpetuation survival mode, because that's not going to work. Because remember, we said before, that survival impulse is, is impervious to the words. So meditation is not going to help. But if we do it preemptively, if we do it as a system, as a, as a regimen, that's a different story. I, 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 I think... That itself has to be explained because so many people have, they have unwarranted disappointments where they didn't read the user's manual and then they say, well, I did it and it didn't work. Well, that's not what it told you to do. It didn't say to do it that way. I mean. Right. And, you know, sometimes when, if my body is having an intense experience, <laughs> I can't go into a place of, of serenity and meditation. I simply can't, but I have still, I still have the tools. And I'm arguing that even if you could, it would be to no, of, no avail or perhaps to, to little avail. Right. But the good news is I don't have to. Meaning al Shait is also very encouraging. You know why? Because it's telling me that even though you can't sublimate the nitzvot and the machshav azara, you could still fulfill the mission you have to fulfill at this moment. You could fulfill your shlichas of this moment. And it's not sublimating the spark. It's protecting your integrity. And that's good news. Again, it's not judgment. He's saying if there's real awareness, there's no excuse for you losing the battle. You don't have to fall into the abyss. You don't really don't have to. And you don't have to kill yourself and beat yourself up. There is a mission for this moment. It, it's, 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 a very, it's a very liberating idea as well. You know, you take off the burden that you have to transform everything. You don't have to transform everything. <laughs> you can't. Right now, Hashem has a different mission for you. Your mission is protect yourself. Just protect yourself. Protect yourself from certain parts of yourself that... Uh, that you have to accept, but you can't let them rule. You can't, you can't put them into the driver's seat. You can, you know, uh, <laughs> you have a backseat driver. And I think there's also a major important theme in Tanya. You know, some of us are backseat drivers, right? Some of you know what that is, right? So I'm driving and the backseat driver tells me everything I'm doing is wrong. Make a, light, make a left, make a right, go straight, back up. You could park, you can't park. It's legal, it's illegal. 
you know, one part of you wants to throw them out of the car. <laughs> the problem is you can't throw them out of the car because it's your husband. <laughs> so you can't throw them out of the car. So what do you do? You don't give him the steering wheel. <laughs> you don't give him the steering wheel. You say, okay, I hear what you're saying, but I will remain <laughs> as the driver. I'm going to steer this car. And that's a major part of the life of the Benini. There's and a backseat driver. The huh? acceptance of the fact yeah. that these incessant thoughts may be a presence. And he yeah. says even a constant presence. Right. And that it's okay. Right. It's okay. You know, part of, part of what gets people um, into a cycle of of negative thinking is um you know everyone has intrusive thoughts that's just right part of being human but when we obsess ab about the the intrusive thought and we feel shame or we feel uh fear because of the intrusive thought so then there becomes the obsession with trying to control the uncontrollable which then spirals even more and, and, and leads to all types of uh, foolish behavioral decisions we would never have made if we would have just chilled out and accepted the fact that these, you know, this background noise, or you call it the backseat driver, is, is, ju is just part of life. So again, I, I, you know, you said earlier that the, the Alter Rebbe is telling you to relax, and then you sort of like dialed it back a little bit, said, no, maybe he's not telling you to relax. I, I, I think you should double down on that because in the Hagdama Samalakit, he tells, he tells you very clearly to relax. He says, listen, if you read this book correctly, what are you going to find in it? Margoya relax. Very nice. very nice. Relax. Relaxation for the soul. Yeah. Serenity, tranquility for the soul. Very so nice. he tells you right up front, this book's going to put you at ease. So first of all, what have we done? To, 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 to recap here. So far. Very good. Okay. So the Tanya, if a chapter in Tanya is not putting you at ease. You're reading it wrong. You're reading it wrong. Right. He promised so, that this is a, a place of Margoyal and Afshan. This is a safe If it's creating place. anxiety, or even not, if it's not creating relaxation. You're reading you, it wrong. You're reading it wrong. Okay. So he tells so first so this of all, every 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 Chabad person or not who studies Tanya needs to know that at the end of a chapter of Tanya, I want to be able to experience uh, more serenity. The end of a more inner, Tanya, more inner should, peace of mind and tranquility. You should breathe a sigh of relief at the end of every pedic. And if not, uh, you didn't learn it right. You didn't learn it right. So, first of all, what does he do? He tells you, hey, you know that, you know that uh, that drive within you? Yeah, it's just blood. It, it's a biological fact. It thinks it's it thinks it's doing what it needs to do to survive. Okay, there's no judgment. There's no moral judgment here. It's just a reality. That's the first piece of good news. Okay. Then he tells me, you know what? And it's Klippa, because really that's just a facade. At its core, <laughs> it wants the same thing that the real you wants, which is wholeness. Okay. And so all of that relief, that relief is coming up front. And then Compound that with compassionate advice, like like we're talking about in chapter twenty eight, where like, okay, just acknowledge your limitations, bow this one out, like don't try to fight it, but then, you know, at, at, at a later date, come back to it, revisit it, analyze it, not in a condemning way, but try to see what you were really going after. T to me, all of this is relaxing. It is respectful it is it is it's honoring i mean it's it, it it's the tone the overall tone is it's not asking me to, to negate any part of me to the contrary the alta rebbe is less squeamish than i am i'm more squeamish about looking in the, at the nooks and crannies and he's saying no it's okay it's okay if it can be experienced it can be talked about and it can be worked with I, I, I want to, because we were talking about chapter 28 so much, I, I, I know we alluded very quickly to chapter 29, and we spoke about Novach and Isa, but I, I think that that deserves. Yeah, and let me tell you a question of people, because we're, we're addressing questions, and it's a good yeah. question. Somebody says, you know, you talk about a person at his or her core 
being divine and a derivative of divine oneness and consciousness and infinity and and, and you're not searching for ego, you're searching for, for transcendence, for oneness, right? And the Alter Rebbe in chapter 29 says, no, the Bainani, who, who, Adam Atzmai, the animal consciousness, the animal, right. that is the person. He is the person. You're not a tzaddik. The tzaddik lives with the divine soul. The Bainani, the person is the animal consciousness, and that's why you sometimes have to scream at yourself. You gotta, you gotta splinter yourself into little pieces. You're like a log that can't catch on on fire. We gotta splinter it, and he even says you gotta tell yourself, you're a meshukat, a manuval, umetuav. You are disgusting and repulsive and abominable. What happened to uh, to this thing that at your core, the real person is the divine soul? It's not what he says in, in chapter 29. And generally, he really believes in, in, in breaking yourself. That's like real self-loathing. You know, you're meshukats, which means you're disgusting. You're metuav, you're an abomination, manuval, you are, are you are a disgrace. You you are repulsion. You you are v'chuli. He says, I have a lot of more names for you, and they're all true. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just trying to add uh, some fuel to the fire you just ignited. So I have one thing to say about that up front. I have many things to say, but I'll tell you one thing up front. And I think this may be, this one point may account for 90% of the issues that people have with this chapter. This instruction in, in chapter 29 of breaking, smashing, I would call it the searching and fearless moral inventory. Okay, because that's what he says. The smashing ultimately is Marad de Chushmana. I want to make this very clear. Nobody has the right to be the self-appointed representative of Tanya to come over to you and say, yes, if you talk, I sense that you need a little chapter 29 in your life. Get ready. I'm going to deliver it for you. Excuse me, sir. No, this is self-administered. This is self-administered. Anyone who will tell you that they're going to be the emissary of chapter 29. Yeah. I will make a radical statement. I will say they've disqualified themselves from teaching you that chapter or any other in the entire time. Because this was something that Al Terebe invited me in a respectful, dignified manner to administer to myself in times of emergency. Nobody has the right to give me a bitush because they think that's what I need. And I think that many times how this chapter and everything that it represents got spoiled for people is because somebody came along as the self-appointed agent of delivering this, this method, and it's never to be done that way. This is something I do for myself. This is, this is, this is, Cheshben uh, and Nefesh means my inventory. Don't take my inventory. I'll take my inventory. I won't take your inventory. Don't take my inventory. Now, I'll put with an asterisk, a disclaimer. There is such a thing. I may ask a friend or a mashpia, be honest with me. But that's when I ask for it. And I want to tell you something. Consent is very important. Okay? Just because I sat at a fabrengen with you, I want you to know right now, that me sitting at Fabrengen with you does not imply that I consent to your bitush. If you are allowed to give me a bitush, I want to be able to tell you when it's okay to start. And I need to know that you know I have a safe word to tell you when you have to stop. So I think that's one issue, but I think it accounts for 90%, I'm just making up a number, but 90% of the issues that actually happen where this beautiful tool gets spoiled. Yeah, 100%, yes. And if I may add, 
there are hundreds of my Mariam and Sichis, and the Rebbe said this probably three, four thousand times, that the core of a Jew is a lakus, chelik elekami mal mamish, and everything else is a cover up. The Rebbe didn't know chapter 29 of Tanya, who who are the Matzmai. The Rebbe himself, in hundreds of my Mariam, speaks about the Atzmias of a Jew. He was contradicting himself. The Tzemach Tzedek, in the famous legendary story when somebody said that your grandfather broke off the lid of the snuff tobacco box. And what did the Tzemach Tzedek say? The Zayd is nishgeven shayich zu brechen. Afilanisht adoimim. My Zayda was incapable of breaking, not even a lifeless silver box cover. He, what did you say before? He unhinged it. <laughs> he unhinged it. So what, the Tzamech Tzedek didn't know chapter 29 of Tanya? <laughs> break, break. I understand. Tzamech Tzedek says, my Zayda, your Zayda wrote this chapter. Apparently he didn't know how to break. So what, what, what are we not reading right? We're really not reading this chapter right. This chapter is a chapter of enormous love and enormous solace and enormous comfort. The Altarebbe is talking about a person who has timtum halev, which means my heart is unmoved. My heart is plugged. My heart is completely detached. Literally, I'm not emoting. I'm not emoting. What happened was my animal soul is so out of whack my klipa is so dense, it's so thick that it really buried my poor, innocent heart. I'm not feeling anymore. And the Altarebbe says, what, what, what can you do for yourself? You have reached a point where this klipa has overtaken your entire identity. You don't even know another identity. So that from the perspective of the klipa, this is who the person is. In my consciousness, this is me. There's no other me. I don't even know me. And therefore, we have to break the shell to find the spark. There is a you. There is a beautiful you. There's a beautiful you. But it's so eclipsed by layers and layers and layers of fear and insecurity and traumas and wounds and loneliness and pain and anger and fear of survival. That You're completely, completely in a broken, broken state, and you don't even know it because that has become the person in your perception. So the Alter Rebbe says, I want you to speak tough words to your shell and say, Ad How long are you going to lie and make believe that you are me? Literally, take a hammer and bust that shell. It's like shock treatment in order to wake the person up. That's what the person needs. Never, never. Because you want to break the person. The Zayda is nishgeven shayich to brechen. My Zayda didn't know how to break. There was no such thing as breaking. For him, the world and the person is divine. What I will do is, I will break and open a hole in the wall so that the light could come in. None of the light is coming in. That's the one purpose here. And therefore, I'm going to be tough with the lie. Yes, I'm going to call a spade a spade. I'm going to call a lie a lie. I'm not going to let your klipa dominate you. I'm not going to let my klipa dominate me for the rest of my life. I'm going to call it out. And I'm going to say, you're a meshukets, you're a metuvel, you're a manuv. You have nothing. There's nothing there. There's no substance there. You're making me meshugah. You're making the world meshugah. You're making yourself meshugah. There is a beautiful, beautiful soul behind this. Please do not do this. <laughs> Stop concealing. You know what happens? You know what happens? It's shocked. And it opens up because it never really existed. It was all a lie. And when you called it by the proper name, what's the proper name? The proper name is you're nothing. You're nothing. You have no existence whatsoever. You exist only because I'm letting you exist. Fear exists because I let it exist. All these skeletons exist because I don't shine any light. Shine light. And it, and it will fall away. And this, the Rebbe says clearly in Asich, in Lekut Asich, is Chelek Yitzai, in Pesach, he speaks the three names of Pesach. You remember the three names of Pesach? It's an amazing Sikh. Chag HaPesach, and Chag HaMatzis, and Zman Cheruseinu, three levels. And he explains this. As the Zayda 
is nicht gewöhnt, Scheich zu brechen. In Kedusche ist überhaupt nicht stuck in Indien von Schwede. Kedusche is never about breaking. I sometimes have to break the outer shell and sometimes I have to use tough words because even compassion won't work. <laughs> the shell is so deep that even compassion won't work. You got to like break it. And as you said, you have to know when, you have to know where, you have to know why. If it becomes a philosophy of breaking, you lost the plot. This is a very temporary maneuver to get through to the real soul. So you need some, you need some waking up. It's the same it you know, but Avram Avinu. It has to be safe. It has to be safe. Because if not, what happens? <laughs> the Klippa gets worse. Well, if the objective was to create openness, right? The original issue was Tim Tumalev, which we, we sometimes translate as an apathy, but really it's, it's congestion. So we're trying to open things. Okay, so if you come and scare me and terrify me and, and, and trigger me, so that's not going to lead to openness. That's going to lead to the, the very opposite. I'll run away even more. I'll run away even more or I'll hide. I'll, 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 I'll dig deeper into my, into my shell. Right. You have to feel safe. And when you feel safe, then this is liberation. He says a beautiful thing there uh, in, in, the, in the end of that paddock. That, the that supports what you're saying. That, that, that really deep down, I mean, that, that all of this is a ruse. All of this is a facade. And that we got to knock it out of the way. You know, the, 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 about the Meraglim, you know. The moment, really- Moshe, the moment Moshe screamed at the clipper, the Yisrael Atzmam Heima Minen. Another interesting thing you see here is Alter Rebbe is speaking to a Benini and he says that he can have Sveikas in Amuna. Yeah. In other words, when a person has doubts, the Alter Rebbe says, you're not crazy. You're not insane. <laughs> you're not a heathen. <laughs> you're not the worst Jew who ever lived. You're a normal human being who has a clipper, <laughs> who has shells and who has husks. And maybe the pain and tragedies of life have eclipsed your internal sense of oneness and faith and and don't 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 worship it. Like don't lose it. That's that's also very powerful. You know, he doesn't say you're a Russia, you're a sick person. How could you have that? He doesn't say how could you have that. He says, Mizay Yachal Kal Adam, these things happen. We have parts of ourselves that when we see tragedy and when we see difficulties in life, our immune is challenged. Right? Famous Sikhin Khaila Gimel about Moshe Rabbeinu versus the Avais. Somebody asks, Shes, I think it's a good question. How do you really translate Midas? Midas is such a central theme in Tanya. He says, you know, if you contemplate, you'll develop Midas. And then he says, and even if you can't, you still have an inner love. What is this creature called Midas? Can you define it? Like, they usually translate it as emotions. Is that it? It's just emotions, what you think, and the emotions come out? Is that really is that really what's happening? Is this CBT models? I mean, today we know there's something that's far deeper than cognition. <sighs> Cognitive stuff are good, but the so, real inner, the real inner inner emotions are not based on cognition. Like so what, I would push this? back at you. Yeah, yeah. And and it, you're you're about you're helping to make the point that I'm about to make, which is you can take a very philosophical approach to this whole question. What is an emotion really? What is a mida really? And and that's why um, everything's relative. Savensich, Vegan Vosmerad, Vumerad, right? As Rabiel always used to say. Context. In other words, I'm not trying to be a nudnik, I'm saying like this. In the context of Sefer Shalbaninim, what do you want to know? Why is a, I know that Midas are an important concept in, in Tanya because he defines them for me rather early on in chapter three. So I know it's, it's a key concept. But tell me why. why. Why are Midas an important concept in Tanya? And then I'll tell you how to define them relatively for our purposes.
person says, the Alter Rebbe speaks to me about experiencing Midas in my Avodas Hashem. He also talks to me about my Nefesh Bahamas developing Midas. And those Midas remain, and those Midas are sometimes powerful. But then there's the Midas of the Nefesh Alekis. And he right away says, Peri Gimel, that Chachma Bina Das will become the mothers and fathers that will give birth to the Midas if there's Das. And that is a central theme throughout the Tanya. Yeah. You know, the, the, the meditation, the contemplation, the awareness, the learning that, that produces, cultivates, gives birth to Midas. And then the Nefesh of Bahamas in chapter 6 is, is obviously dominated by Midas. In fact, by the Nefesh of Bahamas, he speaks about Midas before Moichin. By the Nefesh of he speaks about right. Moichin before Midas. And in Lekut Levi Yitzchak, he says, because the Nefesh of Bahamas is really about Midas, and the Nefesh of is really about Moichin, which is a fascinating concept. So, so I, I want to understand what is this? What, what, what do my Midas look like in my Nefesh of Lekis? What do my Midas look like in my Nefesh of Bahamas? Are, there, are these things I really control? I really give birth to them? Are they innate? Like what? What can I understand this in in, in my day to day life? So, one one thing I always like to do is keep things simple, and That's he does good. that for me. He guides me. He tells me, "You want to know something? Midas. There's seven of them, but let's keep it simple. There's base." <laughs> <laughs> you see, you notice he does that over and over. He says, there's right, there's left, there's center, yada, yada. In, fa- in fact, he never explains. Netzach, Hoyd, Yisoyed, Malchus. Only in the 15, right. Tesvav, but till there, That's he doesn't. Right. Uh... right. And, and it's strange because if, if you're talking to me about the x-ray of the soul, like, you know, give me the map, but he doesn't for whatever that's, reason. That's the whole point. Yeah, China yeah. is not an exhaustive treatment of all Hasidic concepts. It's right. a practical guidebook. So it's going to tell you as much as you need to know in order to do what you got to do. So I don't need to know that much about Midas other than there are basically three directions. And I could maybe even say two directions depending on how much I want to simplify it. So let's say like this. We already said a nefesh is a drive. We said it's a drive. So either that nefesh is going to be driven toward something or away from it. So when my either nefesh, let's, let's, let's say nefesh abamis, because it's more relatable, unfortunately. Okay. My nefesh abamis is driving me toward something to go get that thing that I think I need in order to feel good. That's called Ava. Or if my Nefesh is, is pushing me away, it's telling me, don't open that envelope. That's dangerous, right? That's called Yira. So basically we're talking about an engine which is pushing me in one direction or, or, or another, either toward something or away from something. And that's a pretty simple way, but I think simple is good generally, and especially when we're speaking about something as practical as Tanya, I need to identify, is this, you know, it's it's interesting, the the, the Rambam says, and I... I don't, I don't, don't think that I know this from Meir Han I mean, also, I know it from Lukot Sichas, but <laughs> the Rebbe says that in Meir Han the, the, the Rambam says that a, a, the energy of an emotion can be called a malach. Okay? So... By, by, about, by that's right. So he says, what's the hey raw for me that Yishlach Yankiv Malachim? I have Malachim that I can dispatch? So he says, yes, you do. Right, very good. So you, you send forth your, your radar, your, your emotions to right. check out a situation. And we're constantly doing it. We're constantly giving off emotional energy, right? Okay. So here, here's the thing. My malach, meaning my, my energy, my vibe, okay? Is it, it's always going to be pushing in a direction. Call it a, a, a push in a direction. So is it pushing me toward something or is it pushing me, repelling me away from something? That's about as much as I need to know in Sefer Shalbaninim about Midas. Now, as far as the relationship between Meichen and Midas, 
Again, keep it simple. When I think about a particular thing, does thinking about it make me want to get closer to it or does it make me want to get away from it? I think that's a, a very simple and accessible and, and, and I, I, I think relatable way to describe it without overcomplicating it. Right. Yeah. One thing I think I would add, maybe just to touch on it without elaborating much, because it's really a very intense and deep sugya, is the Alter Rebbe in many Maimorim quotes the Eitz Chaim, Zoba Achid Vitalia, which means that Midois really come from a place that's higher than Meichem. This is a very common theme in his Maimorim. Not, he doesn't say it in the Tanya in the first section. It comes out through the Meichen. It, it, it emerges through Meichen. It emerges after Meichen. But in its essence, it, it, it's rooted pre Meichen, which means that I think Midas could often be understood as our primal, innate drives that are really embedded in us. In fact, there's a mimer, Shlach Tavshin Tesvav, based on Ayin Bey's Shlach, that when it says, that we have to change our midas, it doesn't mean we can't change our midas, he says. Your midas are your innate primal drives. It's like he says, it, 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 it's hatzba, atzmas of the neshama. Elamai, you have to know how you're harnessing it, how it's being expressed. And that's where moichin come in. Because I have innate primal drives. For example, I want to be loved. I want to be loved, right? I want to be connected. That's not bad. It's actually very holy. It's very sacred both for the Nefesh Bahamas in its way and for the Nefesh HaLikis in its way. The Nefesh HaLikis wants connection. The Nefesh Bahamas wants connection. But the way I process my life and my identity through my thoughts, very often those primal drives are now coming out in addiction, in, in craving for alcohol, for gambling, for for. For, not, for, for, for immodesty, for, for relationships that are destructive, for validation. So the Midas themselves are rooted in a very, very deep place that are even beyond Meichen, but we need the Meichen to define them. And it's our thoughts, like you said, it's our thoughts, ultimately, that will channel how those primal drives are being manifested in our feelings. And I think one more element in my Maryam Haktsarim, the Alter Rebbe defines Midas. He says the Midas are experiences of the guf. I think Midas are also not just our primal drives, our NNA drives, but Midas are also our bodily sensation sometimes. And, and there's no arguing with that. In other words, this is what I'm feeling, not a feeling as a deep, you know, primal drive, but as a feeling as this is my experience. And that, that's a very, the Midas of the Nefesh Abraham is like, this is what I'm experiencing. Like you said, it's, it's in my blood. But would you, def, would you define Meichen as value systems? Value system, that's an interesting definition. I'm saying perhaps our value system helps us channel our innate primal drives into a way that can be productive and meaningful and ultimately divine. I'm just touching on this. I think it's, it's very a lot of deep, a lot of deep stuff here in the sugya, in the sugya of Meichen, of Meichen and Midas. So I want to ask you one question, and then I want to lead this to uh, to some form of conclusion. Somebody asked this question. A major theme in Tanya that begins in chapter 35, 36 is that the purpose of creation is Hashem desired to have a dira betachtainim. He wanted a dwelling place in the lowest world and the lowest element of reality. And this became a fundamental theme in Chassidus Chabad. We don't have to elaborate anybody who's familiar with Chabad. Chassidus, especially the Rebbe's Sichis, uh, and already his first Maimer, Basi Lagani, Tav Shnur Aleph, Diri right? The name, the name of, of, of the purpose of everything. I'm quoting, I'm quoting a question. I'm quoting a question. So forgive me, I'm just quoting a question, almost verbatim. I okay. find Dira B'tachtoinim to be very self You're apologizing so much before the question. It better be scandalous. <laughs> You're going to disappoint me. It's not even going to be scandalous. 
I find Dira B'tachtoinim, this wonderful young woman writes, Rabbi Jacobson, I find Dira B'tachtoinim to be very selfish. God wants a home for himself in the lowest world. Fine, go build it. That's why I had to be created. That's why I have to go through all my struggles in life. That's why I'm busy with a conflict between all the various drives in me because God desired that he has to have a home here in me. This sounds to me so self-centered and selfish. No, thank you, but no thank you. I don't want to be part of your dira betachtainam. Yeah, I hear that a lot, by the way. Really? Yeah. Yeah, especially, you know, just to be Magdil the Shaila, people say, oh, nisavet. The taiva God. Oh, so he, my taiva, you come and you invalidate. His taiva. His taiva, we all, we all revolving around his taiva. And I should just say this is not the Alter Rebbe's Kiddush. The Alter Rebbe is quoting a medrash in Parshas Nosai and in Shir Hashirim, both medrash Tanchuma and medrash Rabba. But he certainly turned it into a central feature of uh, Hasidus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, and you know what? It's a legitimate question. And if Dira B'tach hasn't been adequately explained, um, it's, a, it's a logical question. I mean, it's a question, if you're thinking, you can't not ask this. And I should just add, in the more yeshiva show or litvisha world, if you wish, where even when these issues are discussed, They'll, they'll usually quote from the Ramchal, Rabbeinu Moshe Chaim Lotzato, or similar sources. The focus there is, and the Alter Rebbe himself also quotes this in Maimarim, Teva HaToiv Lahetiv, which means the purpose of creation is Hashem is good, and he wants to bestow his goodness on creation. He doesn't want it to be bread of shame. He wants it to be earned but it's all so that you should be able to experience ultimate goodness, and ultimate goodness right. is divine goodness. That's a major theme, which, by the way, is also a major theme in Chassidus. The Rebbe has the whole Fabrengen, Yeral of Nis, and Tav Shulamit Bey is a big part of the Fabrengen, explaining this, this idea at length, and, and many other sources as well. But, and uh, so, we should mention, Tavahat Tev Lahetiv isn't invalidated by Chassidus. So the, the, no. the famous, in Samach Vav, when the, when the yeah. Rebbe Rishab examines the different reasons why the world is created. And Tava Tev Lahetev is, is, is one of them, begin Dishna Maiden Lay, all the different um reasons, and these are all from Taira. Um, but he identifies a deficiency in all of them and that they don't identify why a physical world. So the for that we need to come to the so all of these have val a valid place. Uh, and have one more issue yeah. that they all reach ultimately to a place where there is some form of rationality, but every why has another why, and why, 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 and why does the why, and ultimately you come to a point, okay, but but why? And this right. is what Al-Tarebbe said, Afataivis Kinkashanish, meaning it's rooted in a place that precedes the creation of logic. Right. And hence, logic is irrelevant. Right. So, you know... But back back to the... So what, what, what is this, Dira B'tachtoyinam? Can you define it in simple English? Simple English? Yeah, yeah. Simplicity is the name of the game. Okay. Pshitus. <laughs> ben Chamesh <A> <laughs> There's a guy. He's not emotionally needy. He doesn't need somebody to validate him. He doesn't need somebody to do his laundry for him. He's emotionally whole. <clears throat> He's a competent adult. He's not looking for, practically speaking, his life's complete. And he has this crazy romantic desire to marry the love of his life and to have a home together. And he goes there and he says, Sweetie, let's let's let, let's let's get married. Let's live together forever and 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 live happily ever after. And she says, "What do you really want from me?" He says, "Honestly, <laughs> there's no real rational reason compelling me 
to be in this relationship. Actually, if you want to, <laughs> I hope I don't offend you, but if you want me to get really, really honest for a second, rationally, there are a lot of reasons why my life would be so much simpler without a relationship. But I want you, and not just anyone. I want you, and I want us to live together, and I want us to have a home together, and I want us to be really real with each other so that we can, we can know each other in ways that no one else knows either of us. And she says, wow, you sound different than all the guys. You sound so mature. You sound like you're not just trying to use me. You sound like... I don't know, there's something so wonderfully irrational about it. It's just, let's do it. Let's, let's live together happily ever after. And that's the Dir B'tachtet. Now, what does the Dir B'tachtet get misrepresented as? There's this guy who wants to sit in a hot tub and, and sip pina colada. And he says, you, come over Don't- here. Build the house. Fill up the hot tub and go mix my drink and bring it over here and make sure to put a nice umbrella in the drink because that's that's fancy. So this Baltaiva <laughs> wants his hot tub and his pina colada, and I got to go make it for him. So in the, in the real version of it, it's all about a relationship. You are my Taiva, my dear. <laughs> and the other one, it's, transactional. I've got this time. Hey, you come fulfill it. In Samach Vav, in Tafir Samach Vav, there's an expression, Diri B'tachtoinim, Ladur B'neshamas Yisrael. To live right. you in are with B'neshamas Yisrael. So, 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 Reb Shais, what you're describing it, and, and this is a piss, missing piece, Diri B'tachtoinim, then Hashem wants a home <laughs> Somewhere in my backyard, the home is me. <laughs> I mean, doesn't he say that in time the the Shifta Yisbar, that you're making a place in your? Right. Obviously, so, he also speaks later on about the whole cosmos becoming a dirabatachted, but that's an extension of the personal dirabatachted. Yeah, because we we are all part of the cosmos. We are all part of the cosmos. I mean, it's one. It's one. Un, there's a universal oneness. So, so you're basically describing this potential groom who comes in his potential bride and he says listen i own the world <laughs> and i could be everywhere in the world and i have glory everywhere and i have and everything if i want a hot tub i snap my fingers i got malochim who will make me a hot tub but what what i have come to realize is that i what i really 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 want is just you i just want to be right. i want to be with you now, if the girl is smart, she's going to say, you had me before you made a world and drove a wedge between us. Why didn't you leave good enough alone? And of course, to that, he says, then you would just be me. We wouldn't actually be in a relationship. Then you would just be me. And I have, I have no satisfaction from the malachim who are an extension of me. I want you to be yourself. I want you to have a personality. That's why I'm attracted to you. So it's an irony because on one hand, I like you because you're you. On the other hand, I like you because you're me. You're the real me. And that I know my true self by knowing you. Isn't that a beautiful concept? That Hashem can only be true to himself through a relationship with the Jewish people, as souls and bodies. That's a profoundly romantic thought. Isaac of Hummel writes, Isaac Hummel, who was one of the greatest Talmudim of the Balatanya and the Mittler of the Machzadek, has a maime called Shnei HaMa'eris, and he says there that when Adam tells Chava, Zois HaPam, Etzem Me'atzami, Ubosem Ipsari, now, I finally am touching a bone of my bones, a flesh of my flesh, part of my essence. And that's why she's called Isha, because she was taken from Ish. So he says, Zois hapam. now that you're separate, now that you're separate from me, you're detached from me, you're somebody separate, Chava becomes separate, Etzem me, I can now discover my own Etzem. 
So it's through you that I know a much deeper part of me. So now, now imagine that you didn't know that and you thought that you were just being used. That <laughs> he's got this, this hankering, whatever it is, and for some random reason, he recruited you to fulfill it for him. It does feel... Exploitation. It, it, yeah, yeah, exploitative. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, it's a very... It's a very uh, there's an ugly feeling there. How, how can I love you? And then I have a mitzvah to say twice a day that I love you. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's a mitzvah to me. This. <laughs> I have to love you and, and fear you. Oh, you better love me, and if not, you're going to get punished. So there's such a heavy feeling. But when we can really understand the Rebbe Tachtoinim as really the most extraordinarily loving statement in, 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 in the history of, of eternity. Well, as you, as you were mentioning, you know, the, the, there are many valid explanations for why the world was created. But one of the things that the Rebbe Tachtoinim has that the others don't is its irrationality. And I would prefer to call it it's it's romanticism. In other words, you don't call it irrational. Not its irrationality. It transcends, it transcends the limited it, tools of when logic. When you call something irrational, it, it implies that it should have been rational. Okay, it's al derech what the what the Alter Rebbe says in Shari Yichar Ve'Amuna that when you say that an idea is so profound you can't touch it. Well, even stupid ideas can't be touched. <laughs> you know, ideas aren't t- tangible, right? So he says, you're using the wrong word. So to say that a taiva, and that's what it means, of a taiva, it's it means you can't use the, the metrics of rationality or irrationality to describe taiva. So the, 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 the point is, taiva, actually has a certain rationale to it. Begin Dishtamaidinle has a certain rationale to it. This transcends the Gdorim of rationale. And the word that I would use is romantic. It's romantic, A, because it's not practical. It's, it's terribly impractical. What do I need this for, right? I don't, right? But I desire it. It's actually it's more vulnerable. Compelling. It makes me vulnerable. And it makes, it makes me, me vulnerable. vulnerable. It if you me... say no, if you say no, I'm not in the mood of you. That's correct. That's a dagger, that's a dagger right. in the chest. That's correct. And, the, and, and B, the second thing that makes this so romantic is it's all about relationship. The whole thing is about relationship. Which is a, I mean, Lakutia Morim is not the place for these theological questions. Even the question of Tzimtzum, he says, this is not the place to get into the explanation of it. But um, it's it's from a theological standpoint, it, it's it's mind boggling that absolute reality should crave a relationship with what, with whom? <laughs> He's everything. So ultimately, the answer is with himself. And then you're forced to confront the reality that if he desires a relationship with you, which really means a deeper relationship with himself, that means who are you but his true self. And this takes us back to the whole discussion about false identity and klippa, where if you keep scratching, you will find ultimately that you are one with him. And that that's not just the reality of the godly soul, but that can be the work of the animal soul to make that a reality also here in the world. But what you're saying is you're not just him. You're more him than he is. I, but, oh, you're being recorded. You're, you're being recorded right now. Are you so gonna... This is Lekutei Sichis Helech Chav Gimel. The Sikha of Matas Masay Menachem of. Oh, you're going to go there. Okay. Let's because, do it. Didn't we speak about it once? Yes, we did. When? In public? I don't think it was in public. I think uh-huh. it was back in the summer uh-huh. during, during uh-huh. Matas Masay, during that time. So, so the Rebbe says it should have been called of Menachem, the father comforts. That's right. 
Say, no, we comfort the father. Because the Ben, the child, brings out a dimension of the father that doesn't exist consciously in the father. And that's what he says, the Gemara says in, in Baba Metzia, that Hashem says, Nitzchuni bonai Nitzchuni. My children were victorious over me. Really? Where did they get their power from, if not me? So he says that the Kayach Ben, the Jew, brings out something, Kevayachal, that the father doesn't have in a revealed way. So how does that work? <laughs> if I am him, if I am him, how can I be more than him? When is he truly himself? When he's relating to his other half. How do you speak about halves? And now you're getting to uh, you know, theological danger zones where it's very Why difficult. is he really him when he's relating to his other half? How else do you want to define him? What is what makes him him? How how else do you want to describe Hashem? That he's the creator? That's not an adequate definition. He didn't have to create. Why the need to describe? That, I think, touches upon something very deep. Why do I have... What... <laughs> I'm changing the subject on you, but you're asking me, what's up with him that he can only be him if he's in a relationship with me? What's up with me that I constantly want to understand who he is? Where does that come from, that human beings always want to come up with a religious explanation for existence, no matter how much they try to get away from it? What's hardwired in me? What <laughs> I, I'm asking it that way because I think they're the same answer. I think there's one answer to both questions. I can just approach the one that's about me a little bit more easily than I can approach the one that's about him. So the answer is? Identity. Identity. Who am I? The real me. The one that thinks that ice cream is going to make me happy? Am I a devil for eating ice cream? No, I'm sadly mistaken that I thought that that would make me happy. So who's the real me? The real me is the one that knows that all I ever wanted was oneness. Completeness. I wanted my other half. The Magad says, That's right. right. The two trumpets are the two half forms that need to become one. Hashem and Knesset Yisrael. Rabbi Aaron Strasheller writes, he was, of course, uh, one of the great Talmud of the Alter Rebbe, that he says, when do you see a friend? When, when I'm close to my friend, I don't know the friendship. When we become estranged and we become alienated <laughs> and with this friction and we move away from each other and we're not on speaking terms for 10 years and I'm restless. Oh, <laughs> I'm restless until I reunite with you. He says, here we see the dvekas. Here, here we see it's, it's really one. Here we see who you really, really are. Because logically, you know, a lot of water came under that bridge. You drifted away. So he says, the dveikas of the neshama comes out in Olam Haza. In this world, he calls it the Be'er Mayim Chaim, the wellspring under the earth. That's where the water really, really emerges, the freshest water. He says, that's where you see the relationship, in, in the distance, in the separation. 
that they're really one. That oneness couldn't have been established in oneness. The real oneness is established when there's every reason that there's no oneness. That's one aspect. It's a very rich idea. That happens only in this world. These these ideas, I mean, you been mentioning sources in Chassidus. I mean, this this is Chazal. You mentioned the Magi, you mentioned Anstra Shell. This, this, this is a Medus Shira Shirim Rabba, the Pasik, Yenosi uh, Samasi, which means my pure one, right? But also the Medus says, my, my, my twin. My twin, my twin. My twin. I mean, right. That's a very compelling image that Hashem right. is describing the Jewish people as his twin. Right. <laughs> and, and the Medrash says twins, when one of the twins experiences pain, the That's other right. one on the other side of the world experiences it. There's no... The uh, Rebbe said, Ayid nishta vil nishta ken, zayna nifrit a Jew can't, a Jew doesn't want, nor can he be separated from Hashem. But I think in the Sikha, there's, there's yet maybe even a deeper element, and that is... The real atzmios of atzmos, the real core of Hashem is manifested in the soul of the Jew and the body of the Jew, which actually leaves the divine oasis and goes into a world which eclipses all of divinity mm. and yet completely retains the relationship and transforms the darkness into light. It's almost mm. like atzmos says, I can't go into that territory. <laughs> so now <laughs> you want to go... Dangerous. Now you're taking us into Memtes. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like the shliach, the, the neshama, the goof of the Jew goes into that space. Right. And he could comfort the father and say, Hashem, we're not afraid of darkness. Don't worry. It's going to be good. We, we can transform it into light. So, so there's a whole new self-awareness that comes out in, in, in the presence of the Jew who's not afraid of darkness. So first of all, before, before we even get into that, Let's give give the most. What do you mean, basic. memtes? What do you mean by memtes? Eric memtes. Oh, oh, the pira, the guf. That's that sicha. That sicha says that the guf is greater than the soul because bano v'charta. Bano right. V'charta. So I thought that's where you're going. You're talking now about uh, the guf. About the guf. Yeah. So, which, by the way, as somebody asked, the Tanya talks about the body as being loathsome, nivza, and in chapter forty nine. Right. That's suddenly, the pira. Right. <laughs> he chose the goof, which obviously makes us revisit all the previous chapters of Tanya when he speaks about the body as an object of scorn, Nivza Bain of Nimos in Lamed Aleph and in Lamed Beis, Mishcha de Chivya, the skin of the snake. In chapter 49, it became the biggest Mechutan. <laughs> The most yichis, more than, more than the neshama, what happened? But I think that's really the paradox, the Rebbe Sikh about the three donkeys, you know? Right. There's the external body, the klipa body, but there's the real body. The body keeps the divine score. And I think we're seeing that today. You know, most therapy turned from conversation to body work. It's incredible. And in Chesidus, it says, when Mashiach comes... The neshama is going to get direction. Right. It's going to take its cues from the body. huh? It'll be sustained from the body. Neshama yeah. design is an So what does that mean? With this goof? <laughs> yeah. So in other words, the goof in its pristine state, it knows everything. And, and, and by the way. And yet in the beginning of Tanya, the goof in the Nefesh of Bahamas is like the the source of all destruction and evil. What, what happened? Yeah, and, and it's clear by the end, you know, by, by Nun Gimel, that it's, it's, it's not the problem, it's the solution. The body is no longer the problem. The body is the solution. The, bob, the body has been transformed. You if the you brain. Can't trans- when he speaks about the brain. In the very... I mean, ultimately, if you can't transform the Midas, okay, so transform the Levushim. But... Get the body on board. Get the Navshabamas on board. Right. But I, I just want to point out something, going back to our whole romance discussion about how this is fundamentally romantic. Remember what he says there when he's describing this whole um, 
the, 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 the process through which it even became possible for this othering of divinity, how he encounters himself, he encounters himself in you. What allows that? Something called tzimtzum. And the way he describes it is ahava deichekes habasa, that it's love which creates, which drives this, this, uh, this um, clearing the way, making space for you to be able to be an other. So the whole thing is driven by love. It's clearly it's a romantic story. The othering of self in order to selfify the other. What is more, the term Ava de comes from the Gemara Bab Metzia, which is startling. Very Alpenet interesting piece of Agatha, yeah. <laughs> right? How, yeah. How, how, how men, due to their physical physique, could not have intimacy. But the love shrinks the flesh. So the Alter Rebbe takes this term to explain Simpson. Hashem is infinite. There's no intimacy with infinity. Sorry. <laughs> infinite is infinite. Ain't so. There's no in- intimacy. There's no you. But the, <laughs> Ab- the Musa <laughs> Exactly. So it's much, it's, it's, it's much more serious than the problem yeah. of the Amiraya. Nonetheless, Ava de Chekes is a basar. So Hashem's infinity shrinks, so to speak, of Ayachal, because Simpson is not Kipshuta, and he can have a relationship with you. With himself. <laughs> with you. <laughs> with you, not with himself. So Diri is 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 the antithesis of selfishness in, in, in the most radical way. Is, I can hang out with me. You know what selfishness? Abishter says, I got everything. Ain't Eid Milvade. Who do you think they're talking about? That's me. I'm good. But that's selfishness. All, all, all I want is to be with you and to be with you forever and, and to be with you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I'm not going to take one day off. <laughs> In other words, this is serious. There's no vacation. Every vacation is with you. But but Sunday, but, Monday, I Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, to, morning, to emphasize, night. It's not just about, oh, we're going to retire to the condo in Florida together and we're going to take walks on the beach. It's much deeper than that. It's you are going to find out who you really are. In your marriage with me, you are going to discover your true self. That's right. to me what's... I mean, if it's just we're going to hang out together, we're going to spend, I mean, I don't want to minimize it. That's beautiful <laughs> unto itself. But it's really about discovering self through discovering God or discovering God through discovering self. So to, to me, it all comes down to identity. So when you say Dira B'Tachtoinim is selfish, it's like... Dirabatahtainim is the way in which you discover your own infinity, eternality, godliness. The ultimate self-realization. The ultimate self-realization. Yeah. Yeah. So it, right. So maybe you're selfish. <laughs> maybe you're the selfish one. Right? No, but it, it, they're both they're both losing themselves to find themselves in each other. So it's the so one the Alter Rebbe used to say in his Dveikus, as the Tzemach Tzedek writes in Sherish Mitzvah Tfila, that I used to hear from my grandfather, Mili Bashamayim Vimchale Chafatzti Baaretz. I don't want your Elam Haza, I don't want your Elam Haba, I don't want your Ganeid Na Elian, I don't want your Ganeid Na Tacht, and Nechvil Mernish Taz Dichalein. I want only you. Yeah. The Alter Rebbe could say that because he experienced that from Hashem. <laughs> right? I think I heard this from Rabbi Manas Friedman. In other words, if if I can't experience from my from my daidi, from my beloved, that feeling, you can't say that. 
what do you mean I don't want you, Gan Eden? I want only you, really? <laughs> but you don't want only me. So <laughs> that, that, that's, that's exploitation. Mm-hmm. I want only you. You don't want only me. That's, that's going to be ugly. But if the Alter Rebbe knew that the whole Bria Sa'olam, the whole Matan Torah was Hashem saying, I don't want anything. <laughs> ich will manage das dich. I want you. Then he says, oh, <laughs> I want you. So let's, let's just do that. And I think uh, all of Lakuta Torah is that experience. He's like, I'm not going to get stuck in Natsiya, in Yitzidah, in Bria, in Atsilas. I'm not, I'm not going to get stuck anywhere. You know, there's a mimer in Lakuta Torah, he said, say, when I saw it the first time, I have to say, I, <laughs> my breath was taken for a moment. He says, what's Pizur HaNefesh? There's a common term, Pizur HaNefesh, which literally means the soul is scattered, right? Which we call, you know, tension, anxiety, stress. I'm all over the place. How would you translate Pizur HaNefesh? Uh, I'm squandered. I'm scattered. You know, I'm not anchored. That, that's what we teach Pizur HaNefesh. So Dr. Rebbe says, what's Pizur HaNefesh? Pizur HaNefesh, he says, is that part of you is in Gan Eden, and part of you is in Olam Haba, <laughs> and part of you is Nene Meziv He says, instead of just being one with Atzmus. That's P- Pizur HaNefesh. <laughs> it means I want Olam Haba. In other words, I'm still looking for things that are incentives for my own spiritual fulfillment. And this is what I was saying at the beginning about Nefesh Alakis. It's not just a Nefesh Abamas with better taste. It's not just looking right. for spiritual fulfillment. It's looking for surrender. And that's what I was calling self-annihilation, which is a scary word. But you have to take the person by the hand and you have to say gently to them, the only thing that's going to be annihilated here is the false construct of of separate selfhood. And what's going to be left is the revelation of true identity, of oneness. So if all of this is authentic and true, could we maybe come back now and suggest, Bader Hefsher, that when the Rebbe said, Tov Nun Aleph, 1991, that when the Tanya speaks about every person could be a Bainini, but not a Tzaddik, that's before the Gzairus Vahashmadis. It's before the Jewish people in the world suffered so much. But after the Zichuch and the Biru, the infinite refinement and elevation of the world and of Klal Yisrael, after what we have been through in the last generation, as the Rebbe used to put it, the, the Xeris of Deir Acher, and which of course referred to the Holocaust and everything that came with it between Stalin and Hitler, Yamach Shemam, etc. First World War, Second World War, and all the subsequent results. And we all know that the trauma continues till this very day. It's not like, you know, it's over, right? Epigenetics and all that. Was the Rebbe perhaps suggesting that we're living in a time where we could see more and more that the Nefesh Bahamas is not evil. The Nefesh Bahamas is broken. You're not going to find today an animal soul <laughs> that even feigns, feigns and camouflages itself as a healthy, robust opponent to the divine truth. What you're going to find is a lot of brokenness. Ra in the sense of brokenness. Yitzhahara in the sense of brokenness. Almost the cry, make me whole. And wholeness by definition means allow me to place my mouth on the mouth of the divine soul and declare together Yizgadol V'Yizgadah Shmei Rabba. So we're living in a time where the thoughts that are coming up in my brain, the emotions, the sensations, the feelings, the negativity are actually calling out and saying, Look at me, and you'll see, I'm not trying to derail you. Please, help me realize 
who I really am, and you'll see that I'm trying to bring you closer to who you really are. In other words, we're living in a time where we are indeed much more empowered, just like the tzaddik, just like the tzaddik, to be able to look at every piece that's coming up, every part that's surfacing to the fore, and working it through as a vehicle for, for elikos, for godliness. Which means that there's something happening today in our spiritual and psychological work that couldn't happen a hundred years ago. Despite all of our flaws and despite our lack of sensitivity and, and, and lack of, of, of depth in so many areas and the descent of generations. I think we spoke about it, Yudtes Kislev, that it's been many decades, if not generations, since there was an emotionally healthy Russia. Maybe once upon a time, there was the Mitzvah of a guy who he didn't need validation, he had good self-esteem, and he, just to spite God, he chose evil. Okay? He was emotionally connected. Yeah. He didn't have attachment disorder. <laughs> His parents loved him. And just for the heck of it, he went and he chose evil. <clears throat> but even then, the Gemara says it's a Ruach Shtus. <laughs> Resh Lakish, who was a very successful uh, man before he became a Talmud Chacham. I'm saying the Gemara in Sait, the, 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 the Tanya brings it. There's always a spirit of insanity, even then. But you're saying that today we really see it vividly. Today, that all Ra's brokenness, which means it's skin deep because it's telling you how weak it is. It's telling you I'm a broken kid. I, I, I'll put it this way. I don't know how deep it is, but I know it's not the essence. How deep it goes, I don't know. But I know eventually it, it runs out and you only find goodness. So therefore, therefore heal that and you will always find goodness and, and that's what we find when somebody feels safe when somebody feels soothed when they feel that they're not desperate for survival they're always going to make better choices now will they make flawless choices no but i would argue well, they need to be a little, little bit more soothed. They need to feel a little bit more safe. In other words, nobody's rebelling today. They're mistaken. They're, they're, the, the blood who that's doing its job and trying to keep them alive told them they need this to survive. And so what do you do? Talk to it. You don't talk to it. You soothe it and you say, you're taken care of already. You're taken care of already. You're safe. You're good. I think that's also, by the way, why Teres of Shemtev stresses so much Avas Yisrael and also the idea of and, 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 and Birurim and all of this stuff goes together, but to put it in Pashat Asius. You sit down with a Jew and you give him a bowl of chicken soup and you slap him on the back. What's that all about? What's that all about? Is that some just like a, like a mini chassidim? Just like whatever. No. This is the formula. This is the formula. All the stuff that chassidim is saying about Jews, you want to see it? Give him a chicken soup and a pat on the back, and you're going to start to see all the things that it says about Jews. You're going to start to see it in that Jew. He just needed a chicken soup and a pat on the back, or maybe a few balls of chicken soup and a few pats on the back. But that's all that's standing in between him and bringing out his innate godliness. What, 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 what else do we have left here? To uh... Let's remember what the Rebbe Rashab said about Tanya. He said, Tanya is like Chumash. Everybody learns it. The greatest of the great and the smallest of the small. 
Everybody understands something. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> understands everything. <laughs> so we, we keep on learning it and relearning it. Yeah. Yeah. The Rebbe Rashab said like Chumash. <laughs> Everybody learns. We know Chumash. Everybody learns Parshas Vayeshev every year. <laughs> the greatest and the smallest. Everybody understands something. Nobody gets it. <laughs> Nobody gets it fully. And that's also fine, right? It's fine that we don't get it fully? Of course. Yeah. Ain't safe. Who, who, who ever even... Who sets such expectations that we're going right. to understand it fully? That, that, that it, where does that even come from? The like, Biyoyal once told a story. <laughs> I think this is... Uh, a, 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 a good note to conclude with. Rabbi Yael once told a story. There was a Jew, his name was Reb Shimon Zelichaver. Hashem Yinkam Damai. He took over the leadership of the Yeshivas Chachme Lublin after Reb Meir Shapiro passed away. And he was a serious Oyved Hashem, a very authentic Polish Jew, Reb Shimon Zelichaver. And Rabbi Yael said that he had a special affinity for Tanya. And he wanted the boys should learn Tanya, even though he was not a Chabadnik, a Chabad Chassid, but Tanya was something extremely special for him. And he wanted to inspire the students of Chach Yishim to learn Tanya. So he once told them, he says, Tanya is fundamental. I know every line of Tanya. I know the whole Tanya by heart. The Biyo said he wasn't trying to brag. He wasn't that type of person. He was trying to inspire the students to learn by showing how much he has invested in learning Tanya. So they said, can we test you? He said, absolutely. So they would, they opened the Tanya and they were reading, they, you know, they chose a word here, a word there, a sentence here, a sentence there, and he immediately knew which Peyrik, which part of the Peyrik. The Biel said, and then they told him, Reb Shimela, where does it say in Tanya? V'al yihi shoyta. Of course, they opened up the Tanya, Peyrik Chavches, chapter 28. So the Biel said, Reb Shimela said, thus state in Yedin Shura from Tanya. <laughs> Every line of Tanya says, don't be a fool. In other words, don't be ignorant. Don't allow, ignorance is bliss, but it's not real bliss. Don't allow yourself, don't feel that you need to live in, in, in darkness and in uncertainty and in despondency, and in insecurity, and in fear, and in detachment, and in brokenness. Al Yishaita. I think can... that itself has to be, because <laughs> our, our theme of the evening is to remove the emotional resistance. Triggers, people... triggers. Yeah, the triggers. So if someone hears that, that could sound very, like, brash. You're a shaita. Yeah, you're a shaita. Stop being a shaita. So I, I, I would maybe massage it just a little bit. And in English for 2021, I would say to you, listen, who you really are is godliness. Godliness itself. That's what it told, told me in chapter two. But God also gave you an impulse. It's God-given and it's necessary and it's doing its job. And when it's functional, it's totally harmonized and aligned with and supportive of the mission of the godly soul. But sometimes it's going to exceed its functionality. And it's going to actually beg you to identify with it. And you may be misled to start to think that's you. So my friend, I want to advise you, don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. That's not really you. We'll work through this. We'll work through the shell. We'll get to the real you. Don't be fooled. Please don't be fooled. It's it, as you're saying, it's 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 a compassionate book. It's a it's a relieving book. Every message. Every, every, every uh, he said, yeah, the shura. He said, not just every pedic, but every line, right? Every line. every line is telling you, don't be fooled. Don't, don't forget fooled who you by are. the by uh, by the husks generated by trauma. 
of all types and all forms, compromising your core beliefs about yourself. And and it should and be I, splendid. I would, since you mentioned trauma again, I because I, I think there's a, a that itself. I think a lot of people. I mentioned it earlier that they think, well, you're talking about something happened. Yeah, maybe something did happen. Maybe the trauma is the embodiment trauma, which is shava lachol nafesh. Everyone has embodiment trauma. Symptom. <laughs> so, symptom, that's right. It didn't feel like ava de hekes es abaser. It felt very different than that, right? So, I think it's important when we say, don't be fooled by the trauma to explain what that means. Your, your soul came into a body. It was given a job to stay alive. That message was very confusing. You told me to stay alive. <laughs> it's like Yasala Galem, you know, the Maral Miprag had a Galem. You told me to bring water. You told me to stay alive. So <laughs> don't be mad at this Galem. Don't be mad at this Revius Dom. It's biologically programmed to stay alive. So just, <laughs> and that's the embodiment trauma. The embodiment trauma is I have to fight for my life. No, sweetheart, relax. You're in a safe place. You came here because this is the bridal suite. <laughs> the embodiment was for the sake of the marriage, the chuppah, and the, the intimacy. So you think you're fighting to stay alive, no, 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 no. You're loved, you're taken care of, you're safe. So that, that, that's the trauma, the embodiment trauma is, I think that I need to work overtime at keeping my ego intact, when the truth is I can let go and I can allow myself to shed <laughs> all this extraneous stuff and, and just and feel connection. Beautiful, splendid. There was a, I, I spoke to a, a particular class, a high school graduating class in one of our schools. There was a girl who spoke up and she said, it was actually said, you know, there's this mitzvah to love God. And the Tanya speaks so much about Avas Hashem and Yeris Hashem. She says, what should I do? I don't love God. He's invisible. He's transcendent. I said, what do you love? She said, I love science. I love biology, I love medicine, and I love to understand the body. I said, well, young woman, the Rambam says in Hilchis Yisaydiya Torah Perik Beis, how do you come to love and awe of God, right? She says, B'Shashi is bain in Adam. You look at Hashem's world, and you see the wisdom, you see the splendidness, the awe, the glory, the brilliance, the beauty, and you experience the ecstasy of that, that's Avas Hashem. I said, when you love biology, you love the body, you love science, what do you think you're really loving? <laughs> you're loving the wisdom, the design, the purpose. That's a manifestation of Hashem. You already have a very deep, deep Avas Hashem. So she looked at me and she said, but it says in Tanya chapter 8, at the end, that Chachmas Chitzonius, Come from Shviris Akalim, Klipas Noiga, Bebetamtam Hamoyach. They actually plug my brain. So I, I said to her, I said, we have to understand. Here again, I think people often so miss the message. I said, what is Klipas Noiga? What is Chachmas Chitzonius? Why does the Rambam say that? Why does Alter Rebbe say that the Rambam and the Ramban were immersed in this wisdom? Because you know, What does that really mean? What it really means is, when I'm studying science or physics or biology or or botany or genetics, 
or astrophysics or cosmology or black holes or whatever else, geology, or my brain, right? So there's Klippa Snegel. What's Klippa Snegel? Klippa Snegel means it could be textbooks in high schools that study chemistry and you learn about DNA molecules. And instead of the author saying, wow, 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 Einoid Mulvadoi, the author says, and now finally we know that we don't need God because the laws of nature are responsible for the replication of the cells. So instead of the Klippa, the shell, becoming a translucent manifestation of divinity, it actually turns my brain into an arrogant brain, which some scientists become arrogant people and are invested just to prove that there's no God. The Rambam and the Ramban, who lived in a divine world, for them, every bit of wisdom in the world was just another conduit for, for, for infinite divine wisdom. So when the Alter Rebbe knocks something, you know, some people hear it with so much judgment, instead of understanding, he's making you aware of the perils of divorcing the brilliance of the universe from the divine imprint that is all over it. But when you don't have the compass of Torah, it can become a klipa that eclipses the ultimate truth, that it's a lakus. I think that's another, just another manifestation of that. I asked her, I said, do you know how many sikhs that ever would discuss elements of physics or science? Yeah. And use yeah, it? He, in he, he, he analyzed, he, Tovshin Chavtes, he analyzed how they created the spaceship, Vahigash, to explain Ma and Ban of Atik. In his Rishimis, he did uh, Pascal's... Uh, yeah. uh, On the, the you water. Saw that? The water. Yeah. Huh? Laws yeah. of hydrodynamics, and then the yeah. and then the pi. There and was the a pie, the circle, the Shabbos. The pi, uh, laser technology. Every every year, so often, the there's a whole sikh uh, about atoms, uh, atomic power, Poor atomic power. power. That was that was very often. But he once spoke about how the the atom has a nucleus and the electrons revolving, and he said it's a mighty de kavart that the macro and the micro are one because the exact system that exists in the atom exists in outer space with the galaxies revolving. So, I, I, again, I think this is, you know, you're talking about we're in, a, we're in an era where human nature is, is different. Or maybe our experience of human nature is different. The same thing with the world. You know, the, the macrocosm, the, the universe around us. Look, sooner or later, <laughs> sooner rather than later, it's going to come a point. So right. everyone's going to look around and they're going to look at the physical world and they're going to see, oh, this is Elikos. And not because the world become bottle, but in its physicality, we'll see the godliness. Okay. So is that it? revolutionary thing that's going to happen all of a sudden or is it an evolutionary process okay seems from the Lubavitcher Rebbe's worldview which is you know rather meticulously self-documented over decades where the Rebbe is describing Mashiach and the process of, of bringing Mashiach that it's an evolutionary process and that at this point we are not only we're more refined but it's more readily apparent the world itself, it just it lends itself to this type of analysis. Yeah. Look at the world. So look at the world. What are you going to see? Are you going to see the shell or are you going to see the, the, the core? And, and, and if that's true in physics, then it's true in psychology. I mean, that's been the primary focus of this conversation this evening, that when you look at the psychology of you or me, do you, do you see the shell or do you see the core? Are you fooled? Are you fooled by the external manifestations where I'm misdirected and I'm mistaken? Or do you insist on, on, on penetrating to the core? Yeah. Somebody wrote here a beautiful comment. They said the word is Yetzer Hara. 
The word Yetzer comes from the word Yitzira, creativity, creation. The word Ra means brokenness, Kaisa Ra'ua. So he said, Yetzer is, there is a creativity. But when I'm broken, my creativity is harnessed and directed in ways of brokenness. So I'll tell you something that my mother, Zolga Zunzayn, told me at a time when I was in a a state of like, I would call it post-adolescent crisis. And I was young and I was sort of trying to figure out my way in life and I was feeling divorced from myself. And, uh, and she told me in the name of the, the Jewish psychologist, Abraham Maslow, many people know Maslow because of the hierarchy of needs, very well known. But she told me, this is a Maslow quote. Anyone wants to Google this, could Google this. Uh, creative capacities. That, I like that because the alliteration there, it just sort of poetic flows. But creative capacities clamor. <laughs> See, a lot of alliteration. Creative capacities clamor to be occupied. And yeah, I realized there's so much of mental, emotional, spiritual dysfunction, which is simply the direct result of not channeling creativity. And it backs up and it finds unproductive ways, to say the least, to to, to express itself. So Yetzirah, yeah, I like that. The <laughs> and, and maybe it's deeper. Maybe the Yetzirah is actually getting creative, but due to its brokenness, its definition of creativity becomes very, very different than what we would call productive. Imagine this scene, Reb Sheis, if Mozart would have grown up in a home without a piano. Right? The genius has to come out somewhere. But the question is where it's coming out. So now the Rebbe speaks about a Jew having a Nefesh kiss. The genius of Nefesh kiss is coming out. If you don't have a piano, <laughs> if you don't have the conduit of Torah, of mitzvahs, of, of Yerushalayim, it comes out. Freud's revolution wasn't connected to his Nefesh kiss. Einstein's revolution wasn't connected with his Nefesh kiss. Karl Marx's revolution that destroyed a world wasn't connected to his nefesh alikis. <laughs> of course it was. Of course it was. But when Mozart doesn't have a piano, I'm not comparing Einstein to Karl Marx, of course. I'm not comparing them at all. I'm just bringing out the idea. There is another discussion, but it's not for tonight. You know, people often ask the question, they say, if Einstein would have been a from Jew growing up in yeshiva, he could have never been an Albert Einstein. They would have told him, learn Gemara all day. And if Freud would have grown up in yeshiva, they would have said, you know, learn about Kivega and Masech the Shabbos. Yeah. And how about, you know, <laughs> the Nobel Prize winners, 28% Jewish, revolutionized medicine, economics, psychology, literature. <laughs> if they would have had a yeshiva education, this is, I get emails from people. They would have been told, stay in yeshiva, become a rav, become a rosh yeshiva. But you see from the Rambam and from the Rebbe that that tension is not inherent to Judaism. Right? In other words, Yosef HaTzadik says that with Torah you can change the world even in a more profound way. So I think that's also, you know, part of the whole Deir B'Tachtoinim experience. Just like the Tanya doesn't want you, us to amputate an Efesh of Bahamas, the Tanya teaches us that we don't have to amputate. Judaism is not narrow. Judaism is L'Sak in Oilam B'Malchus Shin Dalad Yud. Ultimately, the whole world is a vehicle for Elikos. And that became the whole, one of the hallmarks of the Alter Rebbe's teaching. So it has so many different manifestations. When, when people ask this question, where do you think it comes from? 
Do you think they're worried about Einstein? Einstein already lived and he died and he did everything he needed to do. So like they're worried. I think some of them feel maybe stifled and frustrated in their own That's environment. That's right. That's right. They're not worried about Einstein being suppressed. No. They're saying, I feel I have a contribution and it's yeah. being stifled. Right. And that has to be addressed. It's, it's their way of, of showing, it's their resentment to the orthodox system, so to speak. Yeah, and that has to be addressed because creative capacities clamor to be occupied. And when you suppress somebody's creativity, it, it causes dysfunction. You know, the Rebbe always encouraged people to be creative. Always. even <laughs> Even if they weren't necessarily involved in the most holy... Always. The Rebbe project. felt that if you're not creative, you're... You're not living up to the title Adam. Adam is creative. Yoitzer, Yoitzer Eilamas. There's an unbelievable sikha from the Rebbe, Yer Aleph Nissen Lamed Beis. The Rebbe asks the question, we have to work so that we don't get nama de chisufa because we don't like free lunch. We don't like bread of shame. Yeah, it's printed in Lech Tasvav. But Hashem could have created us that we would enjoy being schnorrers. We would enjoy okay. being beggars, right? <laughs> and that's it. It would have been wonderful, huh? It's a setup. He embedded it. Yeah, dira betachtoyin. Give me dira betachtoyin. Give me lis anegel Hashem. Give me teva toiv lahetev. And I do nothing. I sit on the couch and I eat divine ice cream. So the Rebbe's vart was that the ultimate goodness in life is, what's the ultimate goodness? To be divine, because that is the source of all goodness. That's infinite goodness. If Hashem would have given us free lunch, our greatest experience would have remained as mekablim. We would remain recipients. Hashem wanted us. We shouldn't only receive from Hashem. We should be God-like. We should be mamish elokos, dveikos in Hashem, one with Hashem. For this, we have to be creators. Well, I, I wanna, we have to be mashpiyim. I want to tell you something. Because I, I think maybe you, you, you didn't feel that this was still on track with our main discussion, but I think actually this is the core of our discussion. You know why I think I like Tanya? And I would guess, if I'll be presumptuous, part of the reason why you like Tanya? Because, tell me if this rings true for you. I'll just say it about myself. Tanya, for me, represents an outlet for personal creativity. I don't feel stifled by Tanya. Tanya has opened up vistas for me to be able to think and talk and express myself and connect to other people. And, you know, our whole, our whole discussion tonight was predicated on, 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 on the agenda of we want to remove the triggers from Tanya and we want people to be able to embrace it. I, I, it's occurring to me only now as we're, as we're speaking that if you want people to start enjoying Tanya, you have to make them mashpiyam. You have to make them Tanya teachers. <laughs> you have to allow them to find their creativity and their unique voice. And I, and, and I, and <laughs> it's actually, it's in, in, in the Hagdam, so Malakit, he mentions he, I mean, albeit in a different context, the idea that every single human being has a different, uh, a different way of perceiving reality. Everyone has a unique voice. Everyone has something to, or like the Alter Rebbe says in, in Hilchas Talmud Torah, that ev everyone has a chilek in Pshat Rebbe's Drush and Said. And, and they have a contribution to make. On, I honestly believe if you want to get really, really practical, Everyone who's ever studied Tanya and been turned off by it needs to be given the opportunity to go teach Tanya. I think that will be the most healing thing. I think that will be the most healing thing. And to a certain extent, that's the system that the Rebbe set up. I mean, you, you, you take a Bachar who barely knows a few lines of Tanya and, and you, you, you set him loose. You say, go, go, go teach. Go teach. Why do you think that Tanya makes you feel and allows you to be creative more than any other safe? 
What is it about it that you you're fail, that you experience? You know, it, I didn't mean it that way, but because I don't know if it's uniquely Tanya that it's allowed me to express myself, but now that you say it, yeah, maybe Tanya more than others fought him. Um, I think it has to do with what we were saying before about its, its endlessness, that it's like the Chumash, that everyone can understand it on some level, but no one can understand the depth of it. It's like everyone has a Pirush on Chumash, right? Like there's so, it's endless. How many Pirushim and Chumash could be written? Okay, there's only one Rashi, but I don't have to be Rashi. I, I have to be me, right? So it's almost like everyone can have a pure shantanya. How is that blasphemy? Is that uh... no? I think everybody needs to have a pure shantanya with the humility, as the Rebbe Rashab famously said. You know, be careful when you're interpreting the Tanya. But if it's going to be myself and Yerushalayim, right? Meaning, if it's going to be meaningful for my life as a Jew, make me a better person and increase my Yerushalayim. He said the contrary. You know, the Rebbe often, before he would say a Pshat and Tanya, he would say this. That even though the Rebbe right. Nishap said the hatter, that... The Hatter for saying... The it is, because it's... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we could also rely on the Hatter. We just have to make sure that it's Maisef and Yerushamayim. Yeah. But it is, when you learn Tanya, it's always Maisef and Yerushamayim. Even if you try... <laughs> Even if you try not to, it's still not. <laughs> Rebbe gets his way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, until next time. You know, the Rebbe once finished the Fabrengen, and he said that the Rebbe Maharash once came back from a trip out of Russia, and he brought a gift. He bought a gift for his daughter, Dvira Leia. And it was fragile, and she dropped it, and it broke. She was a little girl, so she began sobbing that she wants a replacement, but they didn't have a replacement. And the Rebbe said she cried on top of her lungs for hours incessantly, and she couldn't stop crying because you know it's hard to come down from the fence and save face. You know, she already established herself as the ultimate. Sober, but at some point she became hoarse and she couldn't cry anymore. So what do you do? So the Rebbe says she stopped crying and she looked at her family and she says, "Don't think I stopped crying. I just took a break." <laughs> so the Rebbe said, "Me hetni shtof the fabrengen menem tahav So the conversation. Antanya doesn't end chas v'shalom. It's just the the space. Litein nevech ben parshal a parshal till next time. Be'ezer Hashem. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Rabbi Taub. Thank you very much, everybody, for gracing us with your presence. The you organizers, wanna, organizers, the sponsors, the organizers. Again. Yosef Schaefer. Yosef Schaefer. Thank you. Shmuel Silber. Um. Uh, Zalmi and Sarah Cohen in the loving memory of Reb Wolf Gringlas and his Rebbitson and everybody who's here, everybody who's here Reb Shays, maybe take the opportunity to announce about the shiurim you give, especially in Chassidus because there's a lot of people that are still on, I see, on YouTube and on the yeshiva.net and on Zoom there's hundreds of people still on you want to take the opportunity? So if people want to come, uh, we, since we're mentioning Tanya, so if people, will, uh, there's a class in the five towns, Chabad of the five towns, Mondays at 11 a.m. Uh, called uh, Mapping the Tanya. We just restarted. We've been through a few times. We just restarted right after Tishrei. We restarted from the Sharblat. I think we are in the middle of Perek Zion right now. So if you want to join um, that year, also it's, Post it on YouTube afterwards. You could always go to uh, youtube.com slash soulwords or go to soulwords.org. You can find everything. Just use the search function at soulwords.org. You find whatever you need. Okay. Thank you very much.
Yeah. And I'll invite everybody to my shiurim. I give chassidus Monday and Thursday mornings, 7.30. It's on the yeshiva.net. You can watch it live. Or Tuesday, 12.45, a women's class, which is in person on 24 Shea Road in Muncie. And it's also streamed live on the yeshiva.net. So everybody is invited. And uh, everybody should have tremendous hatzlocha. And this special day of Chavdala Tevis, we should all have the merit to absorb the light and the love and the truth of the Alter Rebbe, of Torah, of Elikos, of Chassidus, for ourselves, for our loved ones, and experience that moment the Alter Rebbe describes in Tanya chapter 36, when Ayin Ba'ayin Yiru, when the oneness will be revealed in the whole world. It should be taken from Yad Mamash. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Rabshais, and thank you, everybody. Thank you.